All right, so we're going to be doing gastrointestinal, upper, lower, liver, pancreas, bile tract, obesity. This is a comprehensive overview, as in this is a whopper, whopper, a triple angry whopper. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds awful. That level of we're going to be sitting here for a hot minute. So this is not a super review. Super reviews are quick reviews, and those are usually 25 minutes, and I usually hit a body system. This is a, oh, dear, sweet baby, Jesus, I wish you had anything better to do in the whole wide world than study this lecture. And you know what? It's cool. If you are willing to go through the pain, I'm willing to talk through the pain. And guess what? I've done it. So kick back, relax. May your creator have mercy on your soul. And let's do this. It's going to be cool. We're going to get through it. Okay. Now looking at this, when I see this slide, all I see for test taking purposes is that we need to know 40% of adults in the United States are obese. Big problem, right? People die with morbid obesity. Easy enough. One in 10 kids are becoming obese as early as age two to five, which means that this is a huge health disparity that's becoming a nationwide issue and not necessarily in other countries because it's very disproportionate in other countries. In other words, we're the only ones that suck, okay? That's how this works. So obesity rates are the highest in the South. Duh, we use butter on everything and bacon grease. If it ain't butter and bacon grease, it ain't getting made, okay? Among blacks and Hispanics, think about this. The socioeconomic status traditionally from the status quo perspective is that they have lower incomes, that they have lower education. When you have lower education and lower incomes, you don't know monounsaturated versus polyunsaturated fat. You don't know which one is gonna be worse or better for you. You don't have these options. Your options are McDonald's 50 cent menu on Tuesday and Friday, because you're living in Southern California and you're 18 years old with a baby and no promise in the world. Not that I know what that's like. Ding, ding, ding. So this is why these are such a big deal, these demographics. And you're going to need to know these demographics. They're going to be on the big three, the NCLEX, your standardized tests, and your HESIs, because demographics are always going to come back to bite you. So blacks, Hispanics always are going to be in a health disparity. It super sucks. This is statistical data. It's fact. It's got to get fixed. Until we get it fixed, we're going to keep talking about it. So lower income, less educated, from the South, all of the stereotypical things that we are unfortunately are making in a stereotype and now it's becoming a reality. So I will tell you, I don't see this on your outline of things that you need to know, but just for the purposes of understanding that concept, go ahead and graze over it and move along, okay? All right, so percent of obese adults. Again, I don't see this in your outline, but I will give you a fun fact since we got 20 seconds to spare. The percentage of obese adults, which is like a BMI over 30, and remember 25 is the standard. So BMI is over 30 in the United States. Of all of those, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and West Virginia have the highest rates of obesity. So all I just heard was hollers, uneducated, broke with living in a shanty and everything's made with lard or butter. That's all I hear when I hear those words. So the lowest rate of obesity is Colorado. And what is in Colorado? Mountains, expensive things, and blondes, <laughs> right? So it's like, whoa, dude, I'm in Colorado, I'm so thin, right? And then all these other guys who are your working class people and not the little privilege buddies that, you know, get their little inheritance because, you know, they're a trust fund baby. Those guys are the ones with the disparities versus the people who have it better off, obviously. So that's the only thing I think you need to take away from this slide and the fact that I do a really good impression of a ditzy person who's a skier. So all this says is there is a disproportionate um, irregularity and problem with obesity between basically non-whites, non-Asian. Um, Asians traditionally have a, a better quality of life. They live longer. Um, they have very few health disparities, and it's because they have such a nice, fresh diet, right? Whereas black and Hispanic communities are traditionally put into red zones back from the 50s when they were annexed to be in these 
chemically induced uh, poor soil areas um, that were built into basically black communities only um, because, you know, segregation was unfortunate in this world and it's still a thing, unfortunately, but it was really, really bad back then. So they purposely moved these people in these areas. And as they moved them into these areas, because the factories ruined the soil, they couldn't have nice produce because you couldn't plant the crop, okay? So this is how this worked. So what happened is we created food deserts over the last 60 years because, well, people are racist, horrible bigots, and they can't get it together in their brain, and they can't figure out we're all the same blood, whatever. I'm not getting into it. We're talking about our test. So what you're going to need to know from a demographic perspective, if it is mentioned in your exam, but it's not in your outline, FYI, is that there is a disproportionate number of morbidly obese people. And the concomitant factor that causes the root of all evil is the thing that we still suffer from in the United States and probably, hopefully, will not have that issue one day. But as of today, it's still a thing. It's super fun. We've only been doing this for hundreds of years. Can we be done with this already? Okay. I love you. I'm sorry. I'm yelling. So, disproportionate problem within the black community and Hispanic community related to socioeconomic status, location, and education level. Okay? That's all you're taking from this slide. Sorry, Athena decided to show up and hang out. So, she, she might be chiming in. So, all this slide says is that... Big people have extra body weight. Like, I wish I could have some great tall tale about it, but the problem is accumulation of fat cells or adipose cells, right? So we're about to talk about that. Just big people are big because guess what? They're big. <laughs> That's all the slide says. All right, so when you're dealing with these cells that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because it's holding more adipose, right? more of those cells, it's getting, the, the volume of it is getting larger and larger, it's blown up like a balloon, okay? It, it does two things. It causes hyperplasia, which increases the number of the cells per capita. And then it does what's called hypertrophy, which is where it blows up like a balloon. So it increases in the lipid storage, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it can't handle it anymore. Um, they're triggered and become adipocytes or adipose cells once storage of the existing fat cells is exceeded. So what that means is, is these cells, they hit capacity and then the cell goes, okay, I don't want to get any bigger. And then the obese hormone, if you will, for lack of a easier, a harder way of saying it. So the hormone dump that is sent over is well, I think you can fit a little bit more. And then it jumps into that cell and creates a outer shell of even larger tissues. And this is why we have problems with diabetes because the way that the body is structured pre and post obesity um, is going to absolutely dictate the absorption or malabsorption of that insulin. And if you got way, way, way too much fat, you're not going to be able to do an insulin dump as you would as if you were thinner because the pathway wouldn't be as large because the real estate is smaller, right? So hopefully I didn't confuse you with that. But that's all that this is saying is this is why it is the way it is because the cells get too big and there's too many of them at one time and that's why we have these problems related to morbid obesity. So this is in your um, lecture outline, FYI. So primary obesity and secondary obesity, what is it and what's the difference? Well, all it really is is like type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. So recall, type 1 diabetes is usually a beta of isolate cell issue, right? Big words for the problem is a little bitty piece of the whole component, right? So uh, type 1 diabetics are traditionally juvenile diabetics, right? So those guys are born, will always have. And then type 2 diabetes are the people that can't lay off the pancakes or IHOP or Waffle House, and they're from, you know, South Georgia. So uh, it's kind of that, but uh, we flip the script. So in the case of obesity, primary obesity is just you eat too daggone much and you need to calm down, but you can't because food tastes good. And you're a nursing student, so you got to gain 80 pounds for one test because you got to sit for 20 hours and not move. Now, magically, you have continued to be a cricket size, which is fantastic, but I'm super jelly, by the way, so that's not fair. Not at all. Okay, moving on. Let's study. Secondary obesity is kind of like 
type 1 diabetes. So you have a chromosomal or congenital anomaly or defect, you got metabolic problems, you got CNS lesions and, and disorders, aka you have a tumor that's close to your hippocampus, which is a central part of your brain, which regulates things like time and distance and balance and uh, satiation or being being hungry or being full, right? So it sends that hormone dump of leptin and ghrelin. Ghrelin makes your stomach growl and leptin tells you to leave me alone. That's how I remembered it. So it sends those signals down. And if you have a lesion or disorder in your brain that's close to that area, it's not going to send that signal appropriately and you're going to get overly huge. And then, of course, drugs like corticosteroids, um, antipsychotics do it, a lot of antidepressants do it, uh, which is why we run into issues with women who want to lose weight and they don't want to take their antipsychotics and then women are crazy. <laughs> Surprise. So there's that. So all you need to take away from this is know the difference between primary and secondary. Done. That's it. So this slide tries to throw in a lot of pretty words to make themselves look super cool. So I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to translate it into layman's terms. Strong evidence of significant genetic biological susceptibility factors that are highly influenced by environmental and psychosocial factors. Comma, factors can also be considered individually, but in reality they are interrelated. What that says is... Hey, guess what? This is probably a genetic problem, but we haven't quite figured it out because we're not quite smart enough in this world, but we're getting close. So we're just going to say that there's a biologic susceptibility, a.k.a. if your daddy got it, you might have it. And then we're going to sprinkle in a little bit of, yeah, there might be an environmental component because that's right. You might have a 600-pound mom that tells you to eat chicken nuggies for breakfast because that's what she did, right? Or there's psychosocial factors like, I don't have the money to afford this. I'm a teen mom. I'm a single dad. That type of a deal. So basically, this whole slide says, I have no idea. <laughs> I think it could be this. I'm pretty sure that's got something to do with it. And I'm also sure that they're all intercorrelated. So that's all that that says. Genetic factors are contributors. Biologic factors are contributors, like age, like sex, right? those bad boys and then when in reality it has everything to do with your environment and how much money you had how well your parents took care of you yada yada all the factors so all the things uh, causes this problem that we call obesity so everyone always asks me why does obesity cause cancer why does obesity cause diabetes I'm like that is the coolest question ever and I totally looked it up and I totally got the answer so this is going to help you understand I you know what buddy here's the deal what I'm trying to do with you is I'm trying for you to understand that this world is not three-dimensional there is so much more that is behind your back of your head and, and in the back of your brain that you don't even recognize that's going on around you at all given moments, okay? So I want you to create a cartoon in your head and how this works because once you understand things in cartoons like I do, um, things really start to make a lot of sense in this world and that's when you're able to manifest whatever you want because you know what you've got around you, you know the pieces that you have on the chess table, you know what you can move and how you can move it. And it's nearly effortless once you get really good at it okay we're meant to be those people in this world we're meant to raise the vibration of other people around us who don't know how to do those things we're created to do those things we're created to teach those people to do those things so nursing or not this is what's most important this is why I mentor you not so that you can pass the test I'm trying to get you to understand who you are as an individual, as a man, as a piece of humankind. It's going to take care of mankind, okay? You dig? So, when we're dealing with obesity, this is how it rolls. Increase in fat mass. Duh. Yeah. Obesity, you get bigger. And remember how I talked about real estate? Yes, she said it too. When I'm talking about the real estate of the body itself, when you're dealing with insulin resistance, it's because... That pancreas and that channel and that pathway where they communicate with one another, hey, I had too much sugar, hey, give me insulin, that pancreas and that belly are unable to talk. Because when you stick yourself in between a wall and then you try to talk through the wall, 
you can't hear as well. You can kind of hear it, but not as well. And it's the same concept when we're dealing with insulin resistance. So you've got all of this fat cells that are getting in the way of the pancreas going, hey, yo, hey, you need any insulin, right? And the belly's like, <laughs> but they can't communicate. So that's what happens in diabetes, truly. There's a lot of other concomitant factors, pathophysiology, nerd stuff, yada, yada. But the bottom line is, is that's how it looks from an internal system, okay? So when you're disrupting that, you're also disrupting immune factors and predisposing yourself to certain cancers. Recall, our cells are changing because they're getting bigger and bigger. The shape is changing. It's getting wider and wider. And once I get to my top capacity, then the big fat cells, remember those, those, those high adipose lipid perfusing cells, they bounce in and go, hey, there's room for one more. Like uh, one person getting in the elevator and everybody's touching shoulders. And they're like, ah, y'all got enough room for one more. And you're like, for the love of the good Lord. Okay. That's what happens. And cancer cells will become cancer cells because as those cells change, they start to get sick. And basically cancer cells are sick cells that ended up getting moved and bent in the wrong way. And they got bent in the wrong way because, well, they had all these other issues going on around them. So whatever it's around, it's going to do. So if it's getting distorted, it's going to make more distorted cells. Okay. It's like if, if, I, um, have, if I marry someone who is a genius, right, Th more than likely I'm going to have very intelligent children versus if I married somebody with Trisomy 21, there's a high priority and high chance that that's not going to go well, right, from a cognitive perspective or from a scholastic perspective. So it's the same concept, and that's all you need to know about this, and I've gone on for four and a half minutes for – Clearly, no reason. But here, that's, that's how you, I want you to look at this. So that's why we're disrupting the pathway for insulin. That's why we're predisposing to cancers. And that's going to layer into all the other stuff we're talking about. So that's why I built kind of a bigger foundation on this one. And we just said it. Environmental factors, greater access to food, poor nutritional quality, um, underestimating food and caloric intake, uh, lack of physical exercise, low socioeconomic status. So I don't have money to get the foods that I want, which depresses me. And then I have to sit at a desk for longer to be able to pay for things. So then I have a lack of physical exercise. I get big. I'm poor. I have to buy crap food. And then I have to sit around some more so that I can work more hours so that I can afford that really terrible food. And then I get bigger. And it's just the same cycle that goes on and on. So psychosocial factors, all this means is what is contributing to me thinking the way I think and my own contextual reference, all right? So from the moment we're born, things influence us. That's pretty obvious. And it dictates the rest of our future. That's why they say most children who learn a secondary or tertiary language will learn it before the age of six. And they do that because that's a time where um, the brain is like a library, and when you're a small child, all those bookshelves are wide open and ready to roll. So what happens is, is in those six years, a bunch of info just dumps, 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 because it's got to have something, okay? It's got to have something to hit that space. And then around six, all these books get filled, and then this library goes, okay, now let's make things priority. So at that point, the child then takes out books that don't matter and throws them behind them and just dumps them onto the floor and lets it crash. And then it grabs something that's more important and it sticks it in its place. And that process goes on for the rest of our existence until we hit about 70 years old. And then something kind of crazy happens. And if we get into it this lecture, I'll tell you about it. I don't think we will, um, but I'll tell you about it later on in life if, if it's ever important in the world. And it will be for med surge. Um, two, and for your high acuity class, if you have that, and for your NCLEX as well. Uh, because at that point, things kind of do the reverse again. So this is pretty self-explanatory. And this is probably going to be a question on your test, if I'm honest. So health problems occur at higher rates among the obese. Why? Well, because if you're walking around with a huge body, it's going to give you arthritis. It's going to hurt your bones. It's going to cause you to have other issues with... Um, 
you know, morbidity and mortality problems because of the, you know, impaired skin integrity because you've gotten so big it's burst from the inside out. Like, I feel like I don't need to say these things. You know this stuff. Reduces your quality of life. Of course, if I'm on my 600-pound life and I have to be cut out of my house, I'm not going to check the mail to go talk to Al and see how he's doing across the street, right? Like, that's not happening. Um, most conditions can improve with weight loss. Now, I find it interesting it's off to the side like this. So most conditions can be improved with weight loss. If I were to be a betting man, I would say that this is probably a select all that apply question. And these are the ones that you need to select. <laughs> so just keep those in mind. Because if Willis's brain is anything like mine, and I'm pretty sure that we're spirit animals of one another, that is probably how that's going to roll right there. So just make sure you understand those concepts. Now, I want you to take maybe 30 seconds of your time and scan over these different conditions and think to yourself, how does this create obesity? Like, I would look at it and go, yep, you're depressed. You don't want to do nothing but sit around and eat. Got it. Yep, you got low self-esteem. You figure, what the hell? What do I care? You eat. Got it. You know, and then I just jump down. So I go all the way through and I make sure that I understand why it is the way it is and then I move on. That's just setting your brain up for other concepts and layering on things that we're going to be talking about. Okay. So obesity is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease and stroke. Duh, if I've got too much weight on my chest, then I'm not perfusing because it's squishing it. And if I have a thicker neck and I have all the adipose tissue around, I might be occluding my jugular um, areas. And then if I'm occluding it, I'm not getting enough blood to the brain so that I'm going to have a stroke. Yeah, that all makes sense. I can promise you android obesity patients are at a greater risk is probably going to be on your test. And I say that because we're separating two concepts. So android obesity is fat distribution around the midsection, so around the waist and around the navel area. And then gynoid is the fat distribution around the thighs, uh, the hips, the booty, that type of a deal. So people with android obesity, obviously they're going to be at a higher risk because all of the stuff that matters is at the core. <laughs> and that's where we're packing on the pounds. So that's why it's a bigger deal. So increased LDL. So remember, LDL, I want you to think of LDL, L for lethal, because it will kill you if it's too high. Those are the bad cholesterols, and then high triglycerides, which is your accumulation of all your triglycerides together, like that, that, that final number, and then decreased HDLs, and HDL I want you to look at as healthy, H for healthy, so that's how I remembered it, so we want a high HDL, we want a low LDL, because we don't want to have a lethal heart attack, we want to have healthy cholesterol, there you go, that's how that works, so know the difference between the two, and know that Android obesity patients are the greater risk because you'll probably see that. And now I've got to take care of a drama queen. Okay, so what you need to know for this is basically obesity is 100% related to um, type 2 diabetes. So it's losing as much as 25 pounds can actually stop you from needing to get insulin. Um, it's that big of a deal. So excess weight... Um, is going to be less effective for any type of drug treatment. So you're going to have high blood sugar, the hyperinsulinemia. Um, you're going to have insulin resistance, and you're going to have glucose intolerance, which is why you're a type 2 diabetic. That's all this says. All right, so GI and liver problems you're going to run into, absolutely GERD, because think about it. If you got 50 pounds of extra weight on your chest, it is pushing on your diaphragm and is pushing up as if you were six months pregnant. So your lungs are going to be a little bit smaller, and you're going to have a little bit more trouble breathing, which is why you hear people huffing and puffing and walking. And um, also you have that uh, compression, which will push up the acid. So that's why you got GERD. Gallstones, it's because you're poor diet and you have um, typically too much um, of nutrients that end up causing those uh, calcium plaques that cause the gallstones. Um, so sometimes they need a procedure, sometimes they don't, but we don't need to get into that right this second. Uh, NASH is kind of bizarre. It's for people who get cirrhotic liver, cirrhosis of the liver, and they don't drink. It's because uh, they have genetic factors, and um, basically weight loss is going to improve their condition, but over time um, it, can it can become degenerative if they don't watch out. So those guys absolutely can't have any alcohol. 
All right, Charles, so here's what I'm seeing as I'm going through this. I'm seeing your notes that I have in my hand that you gave me that were the computer notes. I'm seeing the book because I'm going to these pages, and these slides are verbatim what is in those pages. So what does this tell me? It tells me that everything that are on these slides is going to be in your exam because if I'm seeing the literal definition of metabolic syndrome when I'm looking on the slide about metabolic syndrome, and it puts the entire paragraph into bullet format, it is going to be on your examination. So just go ahead and commit it to memory. All this stuff is common sense. You really don't even need to write this stuff down. Respiratory and sleep problems, right? I'm too big. I'm laying flat. I'm compressing everything. I snore. I hypoventilate because I got sleep apnea because I'm too heavy. It's that simple. So if I'm hypoventilated, I'm not getting enough ventilation. I'm not getting enough tidal volume in my breath to sustain oxygenation to support my body, right? So what that does is if I'm hypoventilated, my respiratory rate's too low, which means I'm holding in what? Carbon dioxide, because I can't push it out. I physically can't push it out of my body. So if I have high carbon dioxide levels, I'm gonna be confused, I'm gonna be cranky, I'm gonna be hard to wake up, which are the common complaints of someone with sleep apnea. Bum -ba -na -na. See how that works? All right. Obesity hypoventilation syndrome, same deal. I didn't even look at that part of the slide and I said it verbatim. So decreased lung capacity because you're laying flat and you're choking yourself and your lungs are already cinched up because you're 50 pounds overweight and basically six months pregnant or the equivalent of, right? And then you have that reduced chest wall compliance because how hard is it to breathe with a 50 pound weight over your head or right over your chest? And then they hold in all of that carbon dioxide, and then they become uh, respiratory acidosis type of situations. Again, weight loss can improve the lung function nearly immediately. It's just a matter of 25 pounds usually. Again, common sense. Osteoarthritis, because they're huge and they put a lot of stress on their weight-bearing joints. Knees, hips, those are the killers. Ankles, for sure. So obesity triggers inflammatory mediators because the body's only used to holding so much weight. And anything beyond that, it puts a stress on it. And if you walk around with a 50-pound backpack on your shoulders for eternity, it's going to cause you to have massive inflammatory issues, specifically in your shoulder blades, right? You'll hear bigger people complain that their shoulder blades hurt, and they say it's because of my posture. No, it's because your back is 30 extra pounds than what it's supposed to be, and it hurts because your body's pissed. That's how this works. So cartilage deterioration is a result of you needing things to help with your inflammatory mediators. Like I need steroids because I need a steroid shot because my knees are swollen, right? It's the same old concept. All right, cool. I'm going to give you the steroid shot, which is going to give you temporary relief, but it's going to absolutely break down your bones. So you're just going to fix the... I know it's annoying, isn't it, Athena? So basically you're going to get cartilage deterioration because that's what happens when you keep using these injections and only work for so long. And then you have a hyper incidence of gout and having high levels of uric acid. Again, because this is typically a result of a really poor diet and certain people are um, just have a higher propensity for gout. The, the black community is another statistic that has a higher rate of gout um, and obesity and risk for a lot of other things. So um, that would be a good example of having a higher incidence of that hyperuricemia. Again, excess body fat, you got thyroid problems, duh. Liver problems, yeah, your liver doesn't like having extra weight on it. Kidneys, yeah, your kidneys don't like having to process urine with all the other fatty foods you've eaten. It doesn't make them happy on the inside. Colorectal, I feel like that's self-explanatory. You eat McDonald's, McDonald's goes through your body, you have McDonald's intestines, what do you expect, right? Breast, same situation, endometrial, you don't take care of your body, you don't take care of your hardware in there. Gallbladder, because we have, again, all those terrible deposits of stuff that we're not supposed to be eating regularly that turn into calculi, right? Cancers, because of what we talked about with the cells and how the cell changes, and it's all because of excess body fat. So I guarantee that this is probably going to be another one of those select all that apply questions because the stigma of people is low self-esteem, social isolation, 
in depression, okay? So no one likes to be called fat. No one likes to be called disgusting. And ironically, the fat people are usually calling the fat people fat, which is, it makes no sense to me. And all we're doing is just making life miserable for ourselves. Yes, you have a lower self-esteem, which then makes you depressed, which then makes you not want to be around anybody. And then here we go with the vicious cycle again. So discrimination is also a problem with employment, education, healthcare for sure. Think about it, Charles. If I am a cardiologist, do you want me morbidly obese? <laughs> if I am an endocrinologist and I work with diabetes related issues, AKA type two diabetes, AKA the big people diabetes, would it be smart for me to be 600 pounds? No, why? Because even if you're able to do these things, how dumb is it to have your mentor looking at you telling you, you need to watch what you eat. And they stop at Burger King and you see them in the parking lot. Do you see what I mean? Same concept. So that's all the slide says. So when we're talking about talking with people who are obese, we have to be really, really, really careful because they're, they're overly sensitive because they've been made fun of for however long they've been obese, theoretically, right? And, and that's fairly accurate. I, I feel like it's a fairly accurate statement. So we need to figure out the why. Why are they obese? What are we missing? So you have to ask them, you gotta be very, you gotta be very sensitive. You gotta be very uh, like walking on eggshells, but you still want to pry because you have to have this information for the sake of their health, right? So ask them about weight, ask them about what they eat, ask them about what they exercise. Expect for them to say, oh, I really don't even eat that much. <laughs> Any episode of My 600 Pound Life, I will challenge you to put it on one just for poops and giggles. Turn it on, and when the morbidly obese woman or man meets with the doctor, the doctor goes, why are you like this? He's very nonchalant. He's kind of brash. Like, he's pretty funny. He's like, why are, you, why are you like this? Why are you doing this to yourself? And they go, well, I really don't eat that much. I guarantee you, you will get that sentence because it's embarrassing. It's incredibly embarrassing. Nobody wants to answer those personal questions that they're not even ready to hear for themselves. So address the concerns, tell them their valid concerns, validate their feelings. You have to validate someone's feelings, right? Otherwise you're never gonna create a bond, you're never gonna get your information, you're never gonna succeed, period. I mean, th to me, this is no different than uh, marketing or you know, being a manager or CEO. You need to know your demographic, you need to know how to twist and mold things to their advantage, right? It's very simple. Okay, as we're doing our assessment, there are certain things in the health history we need to know. Genetic and endocrine factors. Does my mom have thyroid disorder? Does my mom have diabetes? So I have diabetes that runs in my family often, okay? And then our objective is to get the test of the liver, the thyroid function, fasting glucose, lipid panel. Thyroid function is gonna tell me if I have hypothyroidism. Fasting glucose is gonna let me know if I am a type two diabetic. Lipid panel is gonna tell me what my triglycerides are looking like and if I'm gonna end up dying of a heart attack before I even try to lose weight, right? Height, weight, waist circumference. Height to weight and waist circumference ratio is absolutely imperative to the BMI, which then is a clinical judgment of how bad our obesity is. And um, ironically enough, what our percentage of success is to be able to lose that weight and go back to a baseline understanding and goal. So again, we're looking at patient assessment, we're looking at BMI, we're looking at waist circumference because that's paramount. Because remember, if we have a waist circumference that is larger in our abdominal area, that's an issue. That's the android factor that we need to watch out for, right? So uh, waist to hip ratio is also a big deal because we might be in the other realm, right? And then we need to look at body shape as well because you could be 300 pounds and not look 300 pounds but still be just as damaging to your body. Or you could be 400 pounds and completely healthy. It, it's the look of the draw and it all has to do with diet, exercise, a regimen of modification uh, as opposed to the ratio of all these other concomitant factors on the slide. That's, that's all this says. So several genes linked to obesity. Now this energy thrifty gene, all that that means is back in the day when we were kicking rocks and getting rid of, you know, I don't know, dinosaur bones because we just ate one and, you know, throwing rocks on mammoths, that type of a deal. What we knew was that if we created energy stores in our belly, AKA if we fat store, that when we come into famine or apocalypse or uh, the world freezes over or there's you know a, a flood and only certain people can get on the boat, right? 
um, any of those things happen and the theory is they would be able to sustain that because they would have reserves, okay? That's all that means. Um, there's a strong link between the FTO gene and the BMI. I, I would say memorize FTO, but long enough to where if you see four different acronyms, you'll know how to pick that one out. Um, I'm not going to get into what it is or why it matters because it's way too much for you, so you're not going to be tested on that, I don't think. All right, so we're wrapping up obesity here. So um, let's recap everything that's on your guided notes, and then we'll add in the notes from the other lecture that you got that are at the bottom over here, and then put it all together, okay? So the etiology of obesity is, again, this accumulation of these fat cells or adipocytes, right? Um, hyperplasia, which means it's increasing in numbers, these cells, and the size of the cells would be hy hypertrophy, right? When we're, we're changing it to a hyper state, we're blowing it up like a balloon, like hyper, we're hyperinflating it, hypertrophy, okay? And then uh, patient education we need to give on them is all of the risk factors, right? So we need to know um, all of the concomitant issues that are going to cause this. We're going to need to talk to them about metabolism. Um, we need to talk to them about behaviors with eating. And we need to ask the following question. What made you gain weight? That will be a test on your question. It is probably going to say in the way of commuting or communicating therapeutically to a patient, what would be a good question to ask regarding uh, someone's obesity and desire to lose weight, right? And then your answer is going to be what made you gain weight, okay? Drugs that can cause weight gain, Abilify, for sure Abilify is notorious for making you have a 19 to 22 pound gain weight within the first six weeks of taking the medication. That's a big problem, okay? Steroids do the same thing. It also messes with what? Your glucose, right? So the more steroids you take, the more it's going to crush your bones up over time, put holes into it, the more you're going to gain weight, which is going to put more stress on your bones, which is why you have osteoarthritis, because you got two things working against you, and also hormones hormones, a.k.a. hypothyroidism, okay? Metformin with Abilify is even worse because Abilify is going to cause you to gain weight and Abilify actually stops the metformin from working. And that's probably going to be on your test. And it's probably going to be kind of in the realm of uh, patient, uh, during patient education, the patient needs further education or further teach back or further clarification for the following. And then the patient's going to make the statement of, I can take my metformin with my Abilify at the same time. And that's going to be your no, no answer because you don't put the two together. You're going to have to switch that Abilify more than likely because if you mix the two together, your metformin's basically going to be useless. And what's the point if you got diabetes and you're taking metformin, right? You're just making yourself poop and have diarrhea for no absolute reason because it doesn't work so that's the take home for your entire obesity lecture and then you can go ahead and hang it up and be done and move on all right so let's move into metabolic syndrome so metabolic syndrome is a pretty easy concept it's tied in with the idea of obesity in that it's going to cause or it's going to be one of the factors that causes the clinical diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Now, I was going to read the book to you and the paragraph that was on there. And then as I'm looking through this and I'm looking at the notes that are on um, your guided notes, and then I read the paragraph, I see that it's the same notes. And then I see that the next slide is your paragraph that I was going to read for you, just broken down into a bullet point paragraph, which tells me it's going to be on your exam, okay? Because if you see it 15 times, it's going to be there. So make sure that you're paying attention to this. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you're writing it down if you need to. And if you don't, then just follow along and you're going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You got this. All right, so metabolic syndrome is nothing more than just a bunch of factors slewed together that's going to increase someone's chance of developing cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, right? Usually happens to people older than 60. Common examples, common health problems, obesity, hypertension, abnormal lipid levels, high glucose, right? It's diagnosed that there's a person that has three or more of the condition that's listed. Now, there's a table that's like 40.12, uh, and it's got to do with waist circumference and triglycerides and your HDL cholesterol and your blood pressure and your fasting blood glucose, I don't think he's going to be that mean to you to do that and make you look that stuff up. 
and I don't necessarily see it here. And let me check the guided notes really quick because I'm a helicopter mom. So let me see if we got anything on it there. And, buddy, I'm not seeing it. So I would take it for face value. Um, yeah, I don't see it anywhere. So what I would think to myself is fasting glucose over 100, waist circumference over 40 inches, triglycerides over 150, HDL under 40. Those are your numbers. Memorize those, and anything beyond that is bad, and anything better than that is good, and then move on, okay? That's all you need to do for this one. Hey, look what I just did. I just didn't look at a slide, but then I talked about the slide before I talked about the slide. So there you go. Look what I just did. I did it again. I'm like Britney Spears, only she's richer and whiter and crazier. Okay, cool. I'll take me. I'm good. <laughs> I'm fine. Let's go back to that. So again, if three or more of the following are there, then we meet the criteria for metabolic syndrome. And like I said, I would just say over 40 inches, 35 for women, over 150 triglycerides, under 40 for the HCL. Remember H healthy, right? Uh, blood pressure greater equal to 130, fasting glucose greater than 100. So that's not a whole heck of a lot of numbers to memorize if you think about it. And I, I would just keep it simple. Memorize those numbers, move on. So again, etiology and pathophysiology, insulin resistance related to visceral fat, a.k.a. The two aren't talking and communicating, so I'm not going to have that pancreatic insulin that I need that's going to sustain my body and not make my blood glucose level levels go in excess. All right, increased prevalence of coronary artery disease. Okay, cool. So we're going to have an increased prevalence of coronary artery disease because if I have hypertension, then I'm slushing my blood around and I'm blowing up those arteries that can only blow up so much. And then they start getting lazy and weak on me. And then that's how you get heart failure. So hypertension is going to cause heart failure in that it's going to make it open too fast, too high. If your blood pressure is too high, it's not just it's high. It's we got so much volume that we are literally pulling apart that artery and snapping it back shut just like that pull it apart stretch it snap it shut like a rubber band okay and over time if you do that it breaks right which is why you get coronary artery disease which is why there's increased prevalence when you're dealing with metabolic syndrome because you have hypertension because you have insulin resistance and they go hand in hand okay see how this all works together it's very very easy if you just get the simple cartoons in your head all right increased risk factor for clotting well Duh, of course we're going to have an increased risk for clotting because if we have hypertension, then is our blood thick or thin? Uh, th -th 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 thick. Our blood is thick, which is why we have a hyper hypertensive pressure because that blood is so sludgy and so uh, viscous and so abundant in volume that, again, it snaps it way too open, snaps it way too shut too fast, and that's why we have this issue. Um, abnormal cholesterol levels, well, abnormal cholesterol levels mean that you have high cholesterol levels, not the good stuff, the bad stuff, the lethal or LDL, okay? So when you have the higher cholesterol levels and you have the higher LDL, you have blood sludge. Because if I'm mixing in blood, I might as well get some Crisco, bake it down, and then mix that in with it. And drop it together and stir it and put it in the fridge, and then it becomes all weird and gelatinous because that is what is happening to the insides of your body when you have an abundance of cholesterol levels and an overflow of it. So just remember, those are the things that are happening on the inside of the body, and that's it. All right, so obesity leads to insulin resistance. We talked about that earlier. Now, this goes into weird cascading pathways. Basically what this says is insulin resistance can impair glucose tolerance, duh, then that leads to type 2 diabetes, which gives you cardiovascular disease because the body starts to break down. That's that pathway. That's all that means. Again, insulin resistance means you're going to have a higher blood sugar. So hyperinsulinemia. whoopity do. We already know these things. They're common sense, okay? Insulin resistance increases coagulation because, again, it's going down a different pathway, and it decreases fibrinolysis. So what is fibrinolysis? It is the ability to catch those clots 
um, via a net. Like uh, you're throwing a net out to catch fish, okay? We're catching those clots because clots are going to kill us. Coagulations increase, which means my blood's going to get thicker. And as it gets thicker, it gets slower. And as it gets slower, it starts to solidify. I want you to think about baking grease and pouring cold water on it. It's going to stick to that pain. You're not getting it off until you put soap on it. The fibrinolysis is the act of dropping soap on it until you end up with no soap at all. So you're going to have an increase of coagulation because of the insulin resistance, because of the obesity, which is going to give you the decrease in fibrinolysis, which is going to be the uh, running out of or you were depleted of your soap to the baking grease in the water. Got it? And then that too will lead to cardiovascular disease because what is solidified baking grease in cold water? It is plaque in your artery. And that's all that this says. I guarantee you that this is going to be a select all that apply. I guarantee you. I say this because look at how many answers we have and look at how many modifications we're supposed to have and select all that applies are usually five. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm, I'm just saying it's either five to seven. So lifestyle modifications, first line interventions. So your select all that apply question that I promise you is going to be on there is going to say in, it's going to say select all that apply, all caps. Lifestyle modifications are first-line interventions in the patient with, and it's going to list these options and some other bullcrap options that don't apply, okay? So let's understand why these are the way we are. So we don't have to memorize word by word what it is. We can understand the concept that there's, so there's no need in memorizing. I got to memorize the line stop smoking so that when I see stop smoking out of those five options, I won't pick the wrong one. That's how you ruin select all that applies. That's how everyone messes them up. You guys take so much worry and time trying to memorize a sequence of words that if you just understood the concept, you wouldn't need to do those things because it wouldn't matter how many words they use to describe it. It would still say the same thing. Okay. So let me show you how to do this real quick. Lifestyle modifications, first in line interventions. Here's how I do this. Reduce LDL cholesterol. Well, no dip, Sherlock. You don't want sludgy blood. You don't want fat in your blood. So first line interventions to fix the metabolic syndrome. Not having so much sludgy blood, a.k.a. don't eat a whole bunch of fat that sludges your blood, okay? Stop smoking. What does smoking do? It vasoconstricts our entire system so we don't get oxygenation. So if we don't get oxygenation, our lungs start to crash. We start to have strokes. Oh, wait, stroke is one of those three factors that you have to have three of. So therefore, stop smoking. See how we do this? You don't need to memorize whatever sequence it says. You understand the concept the smoking equals vasoconstriction equals no blood to my brain equals stroke equals one of these factors that determines metabolic syndrome if I have three of them. Duh. Lower blood pressure. Oh, my God. What a crazy concept. We talked about sludgy blood. We talk about, you know, making those arteries expand and contract unnecessarily via high blood pressure. We talked about the volume and how high blood pressure makes it thicker and sludgier, which turns it into... Your baking grease that's cold on a frying pan that's stuck, and that is what your artery looks like on the inside, okay? So lowering your blood pressure would lower that propensity to have that problem. And reducing glucose levels, again, will fix the obesity issue, again, which won't lead to the type 2 diabetes and won't lead to these other issues here. So that's all you need to know. Cool? Cool. All right, it's our job to educate someone with obesity about healthy diets, exercise, and positive lifestyle changes. Let me make this very clear. You have to do this in moderation. If you point your finger at somebody and tell them that they're doing wrong and that you know what's best and that they need to do this, this, and this, I, I got news for you. It's not the first or even 15th time that they've heard this. They're going to really, really not like you. They're going to walk out of the room. You're never going to see them again. So you have to do this in moderation. You have to build a bond and trust before you can start talking this way to people, obviously. That's all the slide says. All right, so I'm going to talk you through this question. I'm going to talk you through the why behind all of these. Why and why not? The nurse teaches the patient about safe and successful weight loss, which statement, if made by the patient, would indicate an understanding of the instructions. So I'm looking for someone that knows what they're talking about and understands what that means versus someone who is not and is saying something wrong and I've got to re-educate them, okay? So statement number one, I will keep a diary of daily weights on my chart and my weight loss. Okay, that's not going to work, and here's why. If you do daily weights and you're obese, What's going to happen when you gain the first half pound? How, how much do you fluctuate in weight in a day's time? So if a person is obsessed with standing on a chart and standing on daily weights, 
then they are going to not be successful in their weight loss because it's going to make them miserable day in and day out. Okay, they're going to they're going to quit. Um, B, I plan to lose four pounds a week until I have lost my goal of 60 pounds. Okay, life happens when you're making plans. That's a terrible idea. Four pounds a week is too much. Technically, you're only supposed to lose about two pounds a week. Um, so that's why that's not a good idea. I should not exercise more than what is needed because increased activity increases my appetite. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. If anything, activity makes you not want to eat at all. So I would say, nope, that's not the deal. So by default, I plan to join a behavior modification group to make permanent changes necessary for weight control is the answer because behavior modification is really the only thing that's shown. Behavior modification includes you doing a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, 1-year, 5-year, and 10-year plan. And those things, when you start hitting it every day, every time, you start doing the things you need to do, after a 30-day period, that becomes a habit that is formed. So that is why I'm going to say that the answer is D, and we'll see if I'm right. Boom, shaka, laka. Yep, that's it. That's all i got to say. So... Bariatric surgery, is it a great idea? No, it's not a great idea. Do you have a lot of problems? Yep, we're going to get into it because those are going to be on your tests. I can absolutely promise you because they're on everybody's tests in the whole wide world. So we're about to get into gastroenterology. So we're going to talk about nausea, vomiting, colorectal cancer. We're going to go into GERD. And then we're going to start going into like the bizarre areas like the hepatitis and the pancreatitis, right? Um, so that's going to be our next section that we're going to do this in. And if you can learn these in sections, it does better for you so that you can basically go through the entire body system and understand why things are the way they are and what they're doing to other pieces and parts. So I like the way we're studying, even though we're going to have to go through a million slides. So viable option for treating obesity, bariatric surgery. Sometimes people can't do anything about it. They're too far gone. They've got to get themselves fixed in a hurry or they're going to die, right? So it's the only treatment to have successful and lasting impact on sustained weight loss for those with extreme obesity. However, comma, these guys often will die and you'll hear about these guys dying from the bariatric surgery. It's not the bariatric surgery that kills them, my friend. What kills them is the doctor said, I'm going to cut your stomach down to the size of an egg. If you eat too much, you will stretch your stomach to the size of a football, which is the size that it is right now. If you stretch that tissue and there's only a little bit of tissue, that tissue is so thin that if you stretch it too far, it's going to pop. It's going to pop. And guess what's going to pop with it? All your insides and you're going to die. And this is how people die from this. This is what happens to them. When you hear about people that magically go and die and it's on a pulmonary embolism, it's because they blew up their own stomach. I had a patient that did this. Back in the day, Miami Valley had a Wendy's in it in Dayton, Ohio. It's an 1,100-bed uh, hospital. It's got four helibacks. It's a level one trauma. I've, I've worked in the neuro ICU for years there. So this guy had his bariatric surgery and neuro ICU was across the hallway from bariatrics and this guy was adamant about going downstairs post-op two days we're like dude you can't have Wendy's you're gonna die he rolled his eyes rolled his eyes whatever 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 three days went by so now we're on day five post-op he's like I want to go down to Wendy's we said you can't you're gonna die whatever 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 right well he snuck downstairs somehow Went to Wendy's, ordered two cheeseburgers, got to the first one, finished it, and then died. Literally fell out right there. Not because he swallowed it and he choked. Not because he threw a pulmonary emboli because he hadn't been up very much. But because when he hurried up and ate that burger and a half five days post-op, and he had the stomach the size of an egg, and he went and did something that dumb, he perforated his stomach into bits and pieces it would be as if you blew up a balloon and then try to get the pieces back together it's in slivers that's what he did so that's what happens with the situation so this is why you got to really watch out for these guys so here's a funny story if you notice your bmi is over 40 for gentlemen bmi is over 35 for females and comorbidities do you remember what our criteria for metabolic syndrome was that we were looking at either 
earlier, it was a waist size over 40 versus a BMI over 40 and a waist size over 35 for female. So there you go. There's your norm numbers to correlate so you don't forget anything. So other significant comorbidities, aka I need to have metabolic syndrome on top of this because heart failure, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and sleep apnea are all four things that we talked about earlier related to metabolic syndrome. So if you have one, you have the other is basically what this says. So what this slide says is people have to be screened for this procedure. And the reason that they have to be is because quite honestly, a lot of people aren't going to be compliant with their regimen and they're going to kill themselves. And technically as a doctor, it's your fault because you need to make sure that you pick an appropriate candidate. You just don't go, you know, popping stomachs out of people left and right. You got to make sure that they're going to do the things that they need to do so that they survive and thrive and make you look good as an individual. You don't want a big death rate as a surgeon. This is just the facts. Look at it however you want to, think it's mean, think it's not mean. It's not going to make a difference either way because this is the way it's always been done and it's not going to change anytime soon. So for this reason alone, your doctor is going to be uber schmooper pooper careful because we know how high of a risk it is for these people to die. So they have to watch psychological factors. Does this person have a food addiction? More than likely. Have they been treated for the food addiction? Have we started them on medications that will help them with their depression related to the food addiction? That type of deal. Are they going to be able to sustain the pain that goes along with this procedure as part of this psychological uh, profile as well? Because if they are going to be big babies, then the doctor is not going to want to use them as a patient in their success rate. Think about it. They, they don't want to deal with those kind of people because those guys have poor surgical outcomes, a.k.a. They don't heal up because they refuse to work with therapy because their belly hurts, okay? Now, it does hurt. It sucks really, really bad. I'm not doubting that for a second. I'm absolutely confirming that. However, after five days, you shouldn't feel much of anything other than a little sore on the inside. And that's evidenced by everybody in bariatrics yeah. that I've ever worked with as a patient. And I probably have done, I don't know, three or 400 patients in bariatrics um, because I used to help out when neuro I see you didn't have a lot going on on the rare occasions I would go over to bariatrics and work a 12-hour shift there so my job again was working with these post-op patients that's every single patient was post-op either one to ten days post-op depending on what their situation was or they were going into surgery so it was always the same they have to have the pro the profile that's gonna make them successful or they're not gonna do it okay their illness is going to reduce their life expectancy they're not likely to be improved with weight reduction, which means they're not going to be part of this because if they're going to die regardless and they're not going to have better health outcomes, even for a small period of time, it is not in my best interest nor the patients to do that procedure, period. That's all this says. All right, so when we get into bariatric surgery, there's a lot going on and it can seem a little confusing. But here's basically what you need to know. It's broken into three parts. It's either restrictive, malabsorption, or malabsorptive, and then you have a combination of both. So here's how this works. Restrictive bariatric surgery, all it does is reduces the size of the stomach. So it limits the amount of food that can be consumed, and it creates a feeling of fullness by way of it being cinched, right? So malabsorptive uh, bariatric surgeries, it limits the amount of nutrients that the body will absorb by bypassing a portion of the small intestine. And I'll get into that in a little bit because it's a little more complicated. So the most common restrictive weight loss surgeries are the sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric plication. Everyone goes, how am I supposed to remember plication? I'm like, uh, okay, cool. So what is plywood? Plywood is a whole bunch of pieces of wood pieces that are that are folded together to make a bigger block of wood, right? So we take chips and pieces and we make a constructive and uh, constructive board um, for, you know, whatever, making a deck or, or whatever the deal is. So plication, therefore, is folding. So you're folding the stomach, a.k.a. restricting it. Does that make sense? So that's how I remembered it, just because it's easier, for me at least. Um, and then again, we'll talk about the combination here in a second. So just know the difference in the two because you're probably going to get a question on what the difference in the two is. Restrictive 
I'm, I'm sleeving it, I'm cinching it with some type of twisty tie, I'm, I'm shutting things off from being able to go down at such a high volume and a high rate. And malabsorption means the reason we're losing weight is I'm cutting the nutrients out of your body. So there's the two. Okay, Molly, how am I supposed to remember this? Well, these are easy. Um, if you notice, they're A and B. And A and B is very large, and it is in bold. And then C and D, you don't even know what that is because they're so tiny, which tells me, knowing what I know about the subliminal messages and games we play, is that this is probably going to be one of your questions, okay? So here's what you need to know. Adjustable gastric banding, or an AGB, is a band that adjusts to your gastric area, a.k.a. your stomach, and makes you have an effective stomach the size of an egg. And everything that is distal from that band, a.k.a. towards the belly and the colon area, is just going to be like a pouch that eventually shrinks down because that is your new stomach technically. Now, what's the problem? These things can pop. If you eat too much, they are going to break and snap. They can be adjusted, which is good. Sometimes you need to tighten. Sometimes you need to loosen, right? So those are the advantages and disadvantages of that situation versus a gastric sleeve. I've actually done this surgical procedure. It is awesome. Well, for me at least because I'm using biotics. So when I did my surgical residency, I did one of these with the surgeon, with the biotics, and I felt like I was the coolest person that ever existed because I was at that time. So gastric sleeve, AKA I'm cutting a sleeve, removed portion of the stomach is called a sleeve from a Latin perspective. I am sleeving it off and that's all you need to remember. So this ridge at the bottom, so what this is, is it's like a zipper that is a heat coil. And what you do is when you are ready to clamp it, you clamp it down with your clampers and then you grab your biotics or your bionics and you hit the, hit the laser button and it laser heats or cauterizes into this thick tissue. I'm talking about when I go to pull the sleeve out of the body, because remember, we only have three small holes. When I pull the sleeve out of the body, it is steaming as it comes out of the body because the internal temperature of the room in an operating room is about 60 degrees and the temperature of an internal body organ is about 100 degrees so it comes out steaming hot and it comes out smoking because you just carterized it it is wicked friend super wicked but it's super cool so that's the difference between the two and now that i've given you that beautiful picasso of a scenario you're never going to forget it so there you go all right, so I literally said this entire slide just a minute ago without even reading the next slide that was coming up. So it's a band, and it creates a sense of fullness, and it can be inflated or deflated, and that's super convenient for some people because some people want to adjust it. So that's their advantage. And this is just a picture to remind you that that was what we were just talking about. All right, and just like we talked about earlier, the sleeve gastrectomy or the cool surgery that I was able to do, um, you remove 75% of the stomach, right? It is not reversible. Okay? So you're not going to get it back. So what you do is you basically, that tissue, however thick it is, if you stretch it beyond that point of it being that thick, it's going to thin out. And eventually, if you continue to do it, it's going to pop, just like the gentleman at Wendy's, right? So this is what he had. He had the gastric sleeve um, procedure, and he died six days post-op. So it is not reversible. Your stomach function is preserved, a.k.a. you can still hold in all of your nutrients that you need to hold in. Um, you still don't have the nausea involved with having a band because you still effectively have a stomach. What it does is we cut out most of the stomach, so then the signals of 100% of my stomach going hungry, 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 like a hungry, hungry hippo, right? Not being funny, haha, it was an actual game by Milton Bradley. You will also have a hormone dump of that ghrelin. Now, remember, we talked about leptin and ghrelin earlier, like maybe 20 slides ago. So leptin leaves me hungry, and or I'm sorry, leptin leaves me full, and ghrelin makes my stomach growl, and if my stomach is growling, I am hungry, okay? So leptin, leave me alone. Ghrelin, I'm growling. I'm hungry, okay? 
So it results in the elimination of those hormones that stimulates the hunger. So I only have 25% of that hunger versus 100% of that hunger um, prior to the procedure. I will give you a bomb pop in just a second. I am talking on 189 slides. <laughs> Athena says hi. And again, this is just what the procedure looks like from the inside and what we're doing. And we pull out this um, this 75% of the stomach uh, through the same hole that we we uh, made our, our bore hole to get our bionics in there. So we're talking, I'm pulling out the stomach in less than an inch diameter of space, which is kind of wicked. So the Ruin Y procedure is the gold standard. You're going to need to know this more than likely. Um, it has the lowest complication rates because you're not banding. So we're not giving people nausea issues. We're not breaking bands. We're not cutting a stomach in half, basically, or in three quarters, taking three quarters of the stomach out and causing infection potential, right? This is a simple procedure um, that bypasses 90% of the food to the stomach. Um, there's going to be complications with this. I'm going to explain in the next slide. So just know that this is the gold standard. So this is a ruin Y gastric bypass. And basically what a ruin Y is, is it cuts the top of the stomach off. It lets the rest of the stomach do its thing, and then it grabs the jejunum and it connects it to the top of the stomach so that it has the option to go one way or the other. Now, the way that this is set up is it's most of it is going to go through the jejunum and go straight through the intestines, and there's going to be a process of malabsorption. However, you have the most weight loss, the fastest. A common um, example of this procedure is have you ever seen the person like on my 600 pound life that does the ruin Y procedure or whatever procedure and when they lose weight they lose like 400 pounds in two years but when you see their body it's like loose skin and it looks like a like a candle that you melted and then blew the candle out like that's that's the ruin Y gastric bypass because they're not getting the nutrients to keep their skin taut enough for as they lose weight for the skin to come with it so they just have loose skin everywhere because they're not getting those nutrients they need like they're not getting that collagen to have that elasticity of the skin so they lose weight and look like a melting candle for lack of a better way of putting it okay so that's the ruin why procedure all right so the complication with the ruin why like we talked about is you lose so much weight because 90 percent of the food is going through this bypassed area of your intestines so you're going to have chronic dumping syndrome which is extremely painful it's the food doesn't break down and go softly through my intestines in this case if i don't chew my food well enough whatever doesn't get chewed is going to go down the same pipe at the same rate all at one time at 90 percent of the food that i eat whereas the stomach has to dissolve with the stomach acid, so on and so forth. So if you don't chew things up, it's gonna hurt all the way down, buddy, and it goes a long way, just in case you're curious. So they tell you gastric contents are gonna empty too fast into the small intestines and it's gonna hurt like hell, for lack of a better way of putting it. Now, avoid sugary foods because sugary foods are gonna do what? Cause you to have diarrhea, which is the last thing you need if you have chronic dumping syndrome. So this is the quote unquote gold standard but in my opinion, this is a huge issue because I have to watch a lot of other things um, versus something that you have to watch in the beginning of the procedure, but not so much throughout the whole entire expectancy of life, right? So this is going to be a weird analogy, but just hang in there with me, okay, because this is a good one. So this is the Maestro, the Maestro Rechargeable System. Now, the Maestro Rechargeable System is like a, a pacemaker for your belly. So what it does is it communicates with cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve, and it sends a signal that says, hey, I know you think you're hungry, but you're not hungry, you're full, okay? So how is that funny? Well, here's how I explain it to people when they don't understand I tell them, hey, you know Gigi Hadid, right? You know her mom starves her to death, right? It's a running joke. So mom would be the maestro rechargeable system to Gigi Hadid because Gigi Hadid goes, hey, I want a cheeseburger. She goes, no, you want an almond, <laughs> right? She's like, man, I really want a big salad. She's like, no, you want an almond. <laughs> That's all you eat. Here, one almond. You're good, right? Eat a cheese cube until you don't feel like you're going to pass out and move. So that would be the equivalent of a Maestro rechargeable system, just so you understand how this works. And here we are again. Those uh, neuroregulators, those hormone transmissions get sent to the brain differently, sends a signal and says, uh, you're not hungry. 
there I said it. And then your stomach responds by doing exactly that, not eating. So whenever you are talking about preoperative care, you have to talk about preoperative lists, right? You have to do a history and present illness. You have to take a big history. You have to make sure that there's going to be nothing that's going to kill them acutely um, that's going to be obvious, right? So if you have a pacemaker in and you want to have this procedure done, has it been calibrated? Have you been seen by a cardiologist lately? Have you had an EKG and an echocardiogram done before you had the selective procedure, yada, 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 right? Pulmonology is going to determine if the lungs are going to be okay and adequate to deal with intubation. Gynecologists are going to make sure that the hormone transmissions are not going to affect the overall long-term course of what happens uh, with chronic dumps of estrogen or loss thereof of estrogen, so they have to figure all that out. Um, gastroenterologists, pretty obvious, are the one putting in the procedure. Other specialists that might be necessary um, that I can think of, uh, vascular uh, sometimes it have to get involved because if we're having a procedure where we're sending electrical impulses to our brain, we need to make sure that we're not crossing any wires with any uh, peripheral artery disease or um, venous stasis issues that we might have because if we end up snapping the wrong area by accident, which is very rare, um, it could directly affect that pathway. So that's why you would perhaps have to consider that. Um, there are other examples that are probably easier than that one, but I can't really think of it offhand. Um, so yeah, just understand that quick concept of, of why we need to care about those things and what that means for the patient and success. So if you ever do a PACU, PACU is where you do preoperative care. You might be actually be really good at PACU because you're the nurse that gets them prepped, so you prep the room, so you take them into a holding tank until they're ready for surgery, right? So you throw their IV in them, usually they already have it done, so you don't have to worry about that. You have a curtain type of a deal, so it's like being in an ER, it's kind of cool. And, uh, you know, you do their vitals, you get their appropriate size blood pressure cuff, they're going to have to be bigger, obviously, in this situation. Um, you get them a bigger gown, you get them set up, you get them all of their, you know, clothes off and get their gown on and put their little hair net on, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, somebody comes by and knocks them out. And then you just watch them until they come down the pipeline and then you chill for like an hour and a half and you watch TikToks or, you know, work on homework or whatever. And then when they come out of procedure, then you casually triage them back in and keep them stable for an hour or two. Um, and wake them up and then send them upstairs and then your job is done for the day. You usually get out of the door by around 5 o'clock. If you're out by 5.15, you're pissed, you're mad, you're angry that somebody's making you stay over. You guys get imminent pay for being part of surgery team. Um, it's very lucrative and there's a lot of cool people that you can meet and a lot of connections that can get you into some very high places in this world. Surgery is the cash cow of any hospital networking system. So if you get in good with these guys, these guys are the elite. These guys are the white party. Um, these guys are, you know, the P. Diddy soiree. So I could definitely see you doing this if you ever choose to um, actually use this for bedside nursing. This would be the best option for you. So while you're in there dealing with them and doing their vitals and they're freaking out and sweating bullets and asking if they're going to be okay, um, you are getting these things off of their mind by telling them how to use a CPAP, how to use an incentive spirometer. You need to make sure you got a bigger IV in them because it's got to be a longer catheter because when you're dealing with um, surgery, they have to sometimes climb over people depending on what's going on and what position you're in. And it's a weird situation. If you ever get a chance to sit in it, I highly encourage it. It's the most bizarre, wicked experience you'll ever have. Um, so you have to have that longer tubing. So you would just simply switch out your J loop um, for a longer tubing and then you're good to go. And that's basically all that this says. So again, when you get them back, you keep a close eye on them for complications for about an hour. Then you start to transfer them over to the specially trained personnel. So like your um, med surge areas, your uh, let's see, where do we normally put gastric bypass? Well, we put them on bariatric unit, like bariatric med surge versus bariatric PCU, which is very rare, right? So we make sure they got their pain managed, a stable airway, right? 
and we make sure that we elevate the head of the bed so that they don't, you know, start throwing up all over the place because they got increased acid and we need to keep them elevated. That's the number one priority um, in a lot of cases for these guys is you got to keep them at 30 to 45 degrees. That's going to have to be a habitual thing, especially after they eat for like an hour for the rest of their life, right? Because that's just an adjustment they have to make for the procedure that they're having and the complication they're going to run into with this problem. So. Um, you're going to evaluate for signs of them conking out on you and getting too tired. Am I giving them too many Percocet? Do I need to reevaluate how much, um, uh, how much Dilaudid I'm giving them, right? Those type of questions. So again, we gotta get, when, whenever these guys are post-op, they're going to be really tired. They're not going to want to move around. They're going to hate therapy. You cannot do these with these people. These people are five and 600 pounds that are just getting this procedure done. So you have extra weight on the chest, like I talked about 30 slides ago, and it will cause you to have O2 retention or CO2 retention by way of compression and respirations dropping because you cannot physically lift 100 pounds sitting on your chest. Right? But this person has to do it every day of their life through every breath. So it gets tired, okay? especially with Percocet. So at respiratory depress, maybe they got a respiration rate of 8. Right? That's going to cause all of that CO2 to hang tight because you're not going to have that perfect tidal volume that's going to push all that out. You're breathing real shallow, right? So it's just holding it in, holding it in, holding it in, holding it in, right? So hypoxemia, pulmonary hypertension, which is arterial hypertension, which is a big problem, right? Polycythemia, you get really, really thick blood. It gets thicker and thicker and thicker, right? We don't like sludge blood. Sludge blood is bad for a lot of reasons, okay? Risk for uh, DBT, right? Oh, that's always a problem. Infection, dehiscence, delayed healing. Infection scary. Dehiscence is scarier. <laughs> Delayed healing is absolutely going to be a problem if you get into those problems um, and you start having the cascade of a bad time in the operating room. So that's why they have to be diligent in understanding and complying with their education that you're going to give them, right? You're not going to save their life. They're going to save their life because you only have them for a couple of minutes. They're going to have the rest of their life with themselves. And you need to explain it to them that way sometimes. So keep that in mind. And again, the first couple of days of some of these procedures is really, really rough. Even if you get banded and you have the most basic procedure, it's still going to be uncomfortable the first couple of days. I will always give them clout the first couple of days. After about day five, it starts to get better and it's just super sore but manageable, okay? Because I've, I've seen enough of these. Um, but like first part of it, they're going to be in a considerable amount of pain. You got to think. I have just carterized 75% of somebody's stomach from the inside, okay? Even though there's not a teetotal ton of nerve ending areas, um, when you're dealing with, you know, organs and, and all the tissues that are in between, there's not a lot of opportunity like there is in maybe a leg, right? Which there's a lot more surface area and there's a lot more tendons and things that are compacted in. So more nerve endings by nature, right? So with this situation, it's going to go from zero to 5,000. So we've got to keep them medicated. We have got to make sure that we're not going to have any leaks, right? So we need to make sure that we're pooing and that there's no stray blood anywhere. We're not vomiting blood. We don't have any signs of internal bleeding. And a sign of internal bleeding is your stomach absolutely blowing up like a balloon, okay? Um, evaluate your wound and the condition closely. So the little three bore holes that we put in, like in a triangular pattern, you'll need to make sure that those don't get oozy and gross and pustulous. Um, and then you want to carefully transition them into a new diet, not very fast. Give them one and a half cheeseburgers from Wendy's and then they take four steps and die. Okay, that's all the slide says. Oh boy, is this ever funny? Irony is so funny to me. Following bariatric surgery, patients find challenging. They find it challenging to maintain the prescribed diet, aka five days post-op Wendy's cheeseburgers. By the way, Miami Valley no longer has Wendy's in their hospital. <laughs> FYI. Um, patients, they have to reduce intake. They have to reduce fat intake specifically because a lot of these procedures, you don't tolerate fat very well at all. It's like you have your gallbladder removed all of a sudden. Um, it's the kind of equivalent. Um, attention to nutrition is super important. So you got to have a lot of protein, a lot of iron um, rich foods and sources, a lot of liquids though. So you got to be really careful about what you do and how much you do. It, you basically have an ice cubes worth of food um, three times a day and that's your first 
four or five days. If you can imagine what that's like, it's kind of wicked, but it's accurate. So long term, we're going to make sure they don't get into any old habits. Um, they need to make sure that they're reinforced and they have a new body image and they should be proud of it, right? Um, women are going to be concerned with fertility because usually women um, throw themselves into this situation because they want to have kids and they know that that's not going to happen because their doctor said that's why it's not working out for them. All right, so now we're going to get into gastrointestinal. Um, it, we're going to back off surgeries together. So we're going to talk about disease processes, assessment, management, education, all, all things GI related to your scope as a nurse uh, in the practice field. So I really hate it when people try to make things super complicated because they really need to feel that important in this world. I've never understood it. I will never get it. But here's what this big old paragraph up top says. So let's read it. Stimuli from GI tract, kidneys, heart, and brain send impulses via afferent pathways to receptors in the medulla, or the vomiting center, to initiate vomiting reflex, complex act involving several structures. Okay, that's not going to work for me. So what this says is, hey, remember when I taught you about the bear chasing me in the woods process versus the I'm in Jamaica maybe doing illegal substances on a turquoise beach and what your body does in both of those situations, a.k.a. the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. I know I've told you this story. I tell everyone I know this story because it makes me so happy on the inside that other people know. So sympathetic nervous system means... I have sympathy for myself because I'm running because Jason, Freddy, and a bear is all coming at me and I'm tripping over myself because I'm dumb and uncoordinated and freaking out. So I have tachycardia, I have tachypnea, and I have sweating because I'm freaking out and I'm running and I'm sweating and I have a high heart rate because I'm about to die and I breathe really heavy because I'm trying to run, okay? Super simple. Parasympathetic nervous system relaxes your loesophageal your sphincter, increases gastric motility, increases saliva. When you are running from death, you don't have time to poop. Therefore, your intestines stop moving. It's that simple. So when you're chill, all of the opposite things happen. You relax your loesophageal sphincter, and your body goes, ah, right? Your intestines start moving along, and they start moving the poo along the pathway so that you can get hungry again. And when you get hungry again, you have increased saliva because you're not running for your life. And that's all that this says. Now, why we had to get into all of that and try to confuse people with chemoreceptor trigger zones, like all this stuff is advanced practice doctoral stuff. And unless you're a nerd like me, you don't need to focus yourself and your life on it. So... Unnecessary, Elsevier. Unnecessary. Bad form. All right, so you'll notice at the bottom in the yellow, this is one of the things that came off of your um, paper that was typed up. Um, so I figured this would be a good stopping point because this point is probably going to be on your test. FYI. Giving gelatin with nausea and vomiting um, for a patient, it increases um, their ability to intake fluids because it's, it's just liquid that's gelatinized right that's in a semi-solid form um, it's easy on the belly for them to deal with and it gives them a source of sugar right so it does the three things that you need to sustain life so this is always the best starting point and this is why so that's what you need to remember and why you need to remember it um, so they want you in your assessment to identify the source how much you've vomited how when did it happen how many hours ago um, was there chunks in it was it completely like bile color right was there any poop in it because you can actually do that it wasn't just a funny South Park episode it's legit um, uh, you could have bright red blood versus coffee emesis so you need to determine all that um, and make sure that it's not projectile because that can mean influenza blah 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 right you don't need to know any of that for the purposes of this exam, so don't freak out about needing to know projectile vomiting and influenza. I just know it because I am what I am. So just read those, understand it, understand that bullet point, move on. All right, so when we're trying to 
fix someone with chronic vomiting, we have to put them into an acute care situation, right? If they keep vomiting, we're going to have to put them in the hospital. They're not going to be able to eat or drink anything because we got to find out what's going on. Is it pancreatitis, right? Is that the problem? Is it that they're going into diabetic ketoacidosis, right? So until I figure those things out, they're not eating a daggone thing. That's it. IV fluids, that's an obvious one. I've been vomiting, so I need to replace my fluids and electrolytes because I have none because they all just went out the toilet, literally. So... IV fluids are going to be absolutely a proponent. NGT, NG therapy maybe? Is that what that is? Nasogastric therapy? I don't know what NGT is. I'm assuming it's nasogastric therapy. Um, so yeah, if I'm vomiting all the time and I can't keep anything down, sometimes I have to put things directly into my stomach. And sometimes that works out well and sometimes it doesn't. So nasogastric therapy, you would do one of two things. You would either introduce fluids and or... Um, a, a supplement through nasogastric uh, ingestion and or medications, um, which would be more than unlikely. Medications, yes, we wouldn't want to push anything in if you're vomiting constantly because you're still going to vomit regardless. Or we would do the opposite. We would actually suck things out. And that would make more sense because as our stomach fills with just juices in general, it will make us become nauseous. So if we keep all of those things at a very low rate while we're getting concomitant IV fluids directly into the venous system so that we can increase our blood pressure, we can increase that volume of our blood and start to replace our body with those nutrients we lost, um, we have to be really, really uh, careful and we have to get all the bad stuff out, right, so that we don't continue to vomit while we're trying to go through this process. Uh, monitor eyes and nose, that's obvious. You're going to make sure they're not in a depletion. Vital signs, same difference. Your blood pressure is always going to be low. Your heart rate's always going to be high. That's what the body does. Um, psychosocial and environmental comfort, give them what makes them happy. If they have a teddy bear they've had since they were six, cool, get it. Bring it to them. Aspiration precautions, if you're vomiting a ton, um, your esophageal sphincter, sphincter or that epiglottis starts to get lazy and you aspirate a lot easier. So that's all that this says. All right, <clears throat> so our job as a nurse in this situation is to provide nutritional therapy, IV fluids until they can tolerate oral intake. They're going to be MPO in, in this type of environment and situation. Then they're going to get clear liquids. They're going to get small sips of water, what they call sips and chips, every 15 to 20 minutes. Um, then they move on to a room temperature beverage or a warm tea, then dry toast crackers, gelatin. I would never recommend carbonation, but whatever, it's in there, so I'll allow it. Um, progress to high carb, low fat diet. Okay, then you avoid over distension or overfeeding yourself, and then you get a dietary consult if you're still having issues after that. And that is the absolute order that it goes in. Do you have to memorize the order? Mm, I wouldn't think so, but just understand there's a certain way you have to do it. You have to start a certain type of way. You have to start with nothing at all, and then IV therapy, and then move you on to sips and chips, and then move you on to a high carb, low fat diet, and then avoid eating too much and then see a, a dietitian if you need to after that I mean it's start to finish how you need to understand it so what can we do in a care over every education we can tell them how to uh, manage and prevent nausea and vomiting so avoid sudden position changes because that's going to cause rebound nausea um, hygiene in between episodes aka brush your sink and teeth duh um if it's a medication issue, notify your healthcare provider. Sometimes people are allergic to Zofran, believe it or not. Um, so they actually get rebound sickness. Uh, so we have to change them to Compazine, so that happens. Um, acupuncture, acupressure. Haven't really heard anything about it. Haven't really seen any studies on it, if I'm fair. Um, but it's interesting. It sounds interesting. Uh, ginger and peppermint. Uh, ginger and peppermint, good for nausea. Peppermint, really, really bad if you have gastric ulcers. So... What are you going to do? You're just going to subrogate for ginger or peaches, believe it or not. All right, so what is GERD? Gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? It is chronic um, chronic sprinkling of stomach acid over periods of years and years um, that causes mucosal damage to the lower esophageal sphincter and the lower esophagus and also the epiglottis, which is that flap that closes, closes our breathing hole while we're trying to swallow food. So... Acid or acidic gastric contents overwhelm the defenses, causes irritation. There you go. Um, incompetent low esophageal sphincter, aka the epiglottis, and food and drugs um, are a big problem for it, obviously. 
obesity smoking is a big one hiatal hernia is a big one um, so these are these could lead to um, esophageal lesions or strictures sometimes esophageal cancer it's kind of a big deal so that's why um, there's a big push for fixing this problem with GERD and using protonics in the hospital settings so that we don't increase the likelihood of someone catching this and here's just a simple image to understand you know what's going on from the inside of the body all right, so big shocker, clinical manifestations of gastrointestinal reflux disease is reflux or heartburn or pyrosis, most common. That's probably going to be on your test. Um, gives you a burning tight sensation under the lower sternum, spreads into the throat, sometimes into the jaw, mimics angina, not angina. This isn't a gynecology appointment. It's angina. It, mimic, it mimics angina, but is relieved with antacids. Um... Uh, Let's see, you have discomfort in the upper, upper abdomen, that is dyspepsia. You have regurgitation, which is hot, bitter, sour in the mouth of the throat, makes you nauseous. You have wheezing, coughing, uh, nighttime disturbances, so you'll wake up with that acid in your throat and you can't get back to sleep. Hoarseness, sore throat, lump of throat, choking, um, increased saliva production. And again, we see that here we have these ulcers, um, which leads to scar tissue, which thickens up over time and narrows the pathway for you to get anything down, which changes the cellular structure, what causes metaplasia of the cells and or bending and molding of the cells, which tells those cells that they're sick and that they have cancer. And that's how we get cancer cells. So that's what that means. And Barrett's esophagus is the problem. So you need to know that for sure, because I promise you Barrett's esophagus is going to be on there. All right, so the drug therapy is pretty simple. It's either a PPI or H2 receptor blocker. Normally, it is a PPI like a Protonix. Um, this will help decrease the volume and the acidity of all of the contents. Um, it'll improve, improve the lower esophageal function and the epiglottis, that gate. Um, and it will protect against esophageal mucosa. That's the biggest thing here because we want that esophageal mucosa because if we don't have anything there, then it's just bare tissue. So proton pump inhibitors are really, really good for short-term use. Um, they decrease the hydrochloric acid secretion and the irritation that's going on in your stomach. Um, it's most effective for healing esophagitis. Um, you have a decreased incidence of strictures. You need to take it before you eat a meal. Uh, about half an hour. Um, complications, so long-term use, uh, decreased bone density, just like with steroid therapy. Uh, kidney disease, which is never good. Deficiency of vitamin B12, which affects your brain, and magnesium also affects your brain, which is how you get dementia, because magnesium and B12 are very um, important to your remote memory and your ability to rationalize things and your personality in general. So if you take those things out of the way, then you have a person who's you know stranded on the interstate with a handful of lottery tickets and no pants and that would be dementia so that's kind of how that works so h2 receptor blockers um, decrease the hydrochloric acid secretion and irritation this your pepsin your zantac uh, usually takes an hour to start taking effect it usually is done in 12 hours uh, you can get an oral iv you can get it uh, iv piggyback sometimes uh, prokinetics this is going to be a reglan they got some pretty nasty side effects for effects of Reglan. So you have central nervous system issues so like anxiety, hallucinations. You'll get extraperitoneal effects, which is like the tremors and the tardive dyskinesia, um, which is never a good thing. And uh, this can cause a lot of problems. So Reglan is not our favorite. If we do take Reglan, um, it has some other issues. Massive diarrhea, massive stomach cramps are also issues. So why do we have this medication? Well, that's a great question. I have no idea because it's basically junk and it's only good for a handful of things and in my opinion I I can't stand it so it's not worth it so in it and acids basically neutralize the acid however it's not the best in the world to do there's a lot of problems with them you're supposed to take them one to three hours after meals and a bedtime um, you have a problem if you have a history of cirrhosis or hypertension um, renal patients have a problem with it uh, sometimes some endocrine patients do it increases the amount of sodium in your body which is a problem um, recall if you have too high of a sodium it causes uh, tetany basically so you you have to watch out for that because you will cease and that's never a fun day 
So um, renal failure also, there's no magnesium preparations. And what that means is um, you, you need to make sure that there's no um, insidious drug interactions. Um, so that's basically all this says. So we used to think that eating pasta sauce was going to be the answer to this fix, and that's not the case whatsoever. Um, you need to watch out for certain things uh, with gastric reflux disease. Um, this is going to be a problem with peppermints, like we talked about earlier, versus when you're nauseous, it's good for you. Um, no specific diet anymore. Um, avoid foods that decrease the pressure and irritating foods and drinks. So like carbonated beverages are a terrible idea. Uh, encourage small meals and fluids because the least amount or the smaller amount of food you have in your belly, the easier it is for the belly to process that food so you don't have any um, underlying issues. Um, and of course, as soon as you lose some weight, you start to have a reduction in those symptoms. So now we're going to move into hiatal hernias. Um, it's obviously different than an inguinal hernia and causes some pretty um, some pretty pretty specific symptoms that are in close proximity to uh, a traditional GERD. Only there's a different type of pain involved. So let's let's get into it and unpack it. So just so you understand what a hiatal hernia really is and why it's such a big deal. So this is the diaphragm. I'm not sure if you can see my error or not, but look at the dark red. That's the diaphragm. So that means everything above that level is chest, okay? And everything below that is stomach and intestines and abdominal cavity. Now what happens with a hiatal hernia is this part over here that says lower esophageal sphincter and hernia on the A uh, diagram, um, that actually goes past the diaphragm and it pouches into the chest wall. So that's why people feel like they're having a heart attack. So you will have intense chest pressure and it feels like you are being stepped on by a very, very heavy individual. Um, it's, it's no fun. So the most common type is a sliding hiatal hernia. And that means that it temporarily slides into your outpatching of your stomach temporarily slides out through a hole in your diaphragm and it pushes into your chest wall and you are in the presence of your other organs at that point. Um, the other one is a parasophageal uh, hiatal hernia and that is a gastroesophageal junction type of an issue. Um, so it, it it is a little bit less of an outpouching. Some of these actually need to have surgical intervention. It's usually if the medications aren't doing their job and their justice that they will do surgical intervention. There are technically four types of hiatal hernias. These are the most common two. A is going to be your sliding hiatal hernia. B is going to be your parasophageal. So how does this happen? Well, it happens because there's a weakened muscle in the diaphragm and the, esophage uh, the esophageogastric opening. Um, because of the increased intra-abdominal pressure. So a lot of things cause that. Um, it feels like GERD on steroids. Um, there's no way to really describe it. It's, it's incredible chest pain. I've had it before. I've had it uh, my entire natural life as far as I know. Um, you feel like you can't breathe when it's that bad. Um, things that make it worse, soda pop, it's terrible. It's the absolute worst. Um, any type of roughage like lettuce, if you, if I eat a salad, I know I'm going to be hurting. So I automatically pre-medicate because it's just, it, it, it's going to be very painful. Um, and you just kind of deal with it. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do and the hernia repair that they do for it, it sometimes causes you more damage than good. So I opted out very early with that option. So again, heartburn, GERD, esophagitis, ulcers, hemorrhage, um, you know, stenosis strangulation, that's a problem, especially in the esophagus where you all of a sudden can't breathe because um, all of those lesions have gotten scar tissue and there's no more airway left. That's always a big problem. And then of course, aspiration where things dump into your lungs. Now to diagnose a hiatal hernia, you have to do what's called a barium swallow or endoscopy. A barium swallow is when you drink uh, an ink that has a, not a radioactive tracer, it has a, an iodine on it that highlights the area. So then what you do is you drink this stuff and then over a period of two hours, it will show how much of that went into your stomach versus how much is still hanging around other areas because your peristalsis or your intestinal motility is too slow. Okay. 
This will show if there is something kinked or cramped or if something is narrowed and that's why it can't get all, all the way down fast enough. So this is a standard test. Um, it's going to be the same diagnostic studies as GERD. Endoscopy, of course, they're going to check to see if there's any narrowing. Of course, they want to reduce that intra-abdominal pressure. Um, they will reduce the hernia. They will optimize the lower esophageal pressure. Um, they usually do that through a Nissen procedure. We might, may or may not talk about that. I'm not sure. And prevent movement of uh, the junction itself. So these are the names of the different type of procedures that could be done. I don't think you're going to see any of this stuff, to be honest, but please know that barium swallow or endoscopy is going to be your standard um, diagnostic study for GERD and hiatal hernia. So as you get older, you have more of these issues. I, I can't personally say that I have because, you know, I, it's been better for me, but whatever. Um, but as a, as a whole, when people have bad habits, they keep those bad habits and they don't change it. So that's why they progressively get worse. I guess that's where they're coming from. Sorry. I haven't slept very much. Okay. So. Decrease lower esophageal pressure. You've got to stay away from nitrates, calcium channel blockers, and antidepressants if you have a massive hiatal hernia because it is going to decrease the lower esophageal pressure, a.k.a. the epiglottis. It is that flap that brings all the food down and keeps you from choking on it, okay? So you've got to stay away from these medications because it's absolutely going to be imperative that you don't put your lower esophageal sphincter in this type of position, all right? So what you could do is you can actually get medication-induced esophagitis, and that is where your esophagus gets so inflamed. Remember, itis. Itis in Latin is inflammation. Esopho is the esophagus, obviously. So esophagitis is the inflammation of the esophagus, and you can medically induce this problem, which can kill you, through NSAIDs and too much potassium. Okay? So the first sign is usually a severe sign because if you were used to having this problem, you're used to having the pain, you're used to going, eh, it's not that big of a deal until you finally start bleeding from your esophagus or you start aspirating and coughing all over the place and then you start coughing up blood. No, it's not tuberculosis. It's you having a massive hiatal hernia that hasn't been fixed and needs repaired. So um, your management is going to be the same as anybody else, making sure you're taking your PPIs, making sure you're taking your H2 receptor medications, make, making sure that you change your diet habits, you stay away from sodas, yada, 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 right? All right, so let's talk about the cha-cha-chas and hurry up and get through this. Like diarrhea hurries up and gets through you. So there you go. But um, shh. All right, so the technical definition of diarrhea is passage of three or more stools in a day, um, it has to be acute, so 14 days or less. It has to be persistent more than 14 days. Chronic is going to be more than 30 days, okay? So acute insidious onset, 14 days or less. Persistent, 14. Chronic, 30 or more. So when you're dealing with any type of stools that last 14 days, you want to find out if the person has a history of IBS because this is a normal finding for a person with IBS. So if they have a history of IBS, will they have chronic diarrhea? Yes, they will. Will they have chronic constipation? They will also have that as well. It just kind of depends on the situation. So make sure that you understand it's got to be a passage of three or more stools per day, and it's got to be watery. I know that this is getting a little graphic, but diarrhea is not soft form. I don't know why people can't get through that. So when we're C. diff testing people, it's got to be straight up water. If it's formed in any way, shape, form, or fashion, when you stick it into that cup, they're going to reject it and send it back. So just keep that in mind. All right, so etiology and pathophysiology. This slide, you might as well commit it to memory. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to bite you. So primary causes infectious organisms. In the United States, we got viruses, most common. Okay. So viruses are infectious organisms. I would I would buy that for a dollar. Escher coli is the bloody diarrhea that you'll have. Uh, Guardia lambia or lamblia. I haven't seen that before, and I'm super glad that I haven't because I couldn't imagine. Um, I can't handle tapeworms. Sorry, can't do that. Um, I can't handle hookworms or any worms. Just the word worm doesn't make me feel very good. And then, of course, you got the hospital acquired um, Clostridium difficile. Now, I need for you to look at Escher coli and know that it's going to give you bloody diarrhea. Know that it's going to be that weird 0157H7, right? Because I don't know what he's going to throw out there. But um, the intestinal parasite, know that it's it's uh, it's Gerida, right? Know that Clostridium difficile is hospital acquired, right? So that would be my takeaway from this slide.
Now, this stuff is transmitted a lot of times through contaminated food or water, fecal or root. People not washing their hands and being nasty, okay? So what we have is we have infectious organisms that are going to mess with your intestines. They're going to do it in a couple of ways. They're going to either um, mess with your ability to absorb nutrients and then make you dehydrated by way of that, right? And that's usually in your small intestine. Or they're going to completely impair the absorption by just killing the cells altogether. So it's going to cause massive inflammation because that uh, mucous membrane tissue is going to be bare and it's not going to be slimy and it's not going to be protective. Um, and then you're going to have massive inflammation in the colon and it's going to produce toxins and then you're going to get an infection and it's a big old fat bummer. Obviously, the older you are, the more susceptible you are to having this because as you get older, your immunity changes, uh, gastric acidity, PPIs decrease stomach acid, um, organisms survive when you have decreased stomach acid, so long-term use of of uh, PPIs are never a good idea, just like we talked about earlier. Intestinal microflora, um, that is, well, the most serious um, antibiotic-associated diarrhea is going to be your C. difficile. And it is going to be usually, if you're taking um, any type of uh, rocephin, uh, what's another one that really hits it hard? Uh, Flagyl is a really bad one, too. Um, that just tears away that intestinal lining. So whenever your microflora get killed, uh, what happens is you get these infections is the big deal. And then immunocompromised patients obviously are going to have bigger issues um, because of their disease process. And a lot of times um, they are going to have to get uh, enteral feedings or they're going to have to get um, some type of J-tube or G-tube. All right, other reasons for diarrhea is not infectious. It's going to be laxatives. Large amounts of undigested heart, uh, carbohydrates or um, an incredible amount of lactose if you're lactose intolerant. Um, rapid GI transit, that's uh, through osmosis. So basically what that means is um, I am putting too much fluid and fiber through my body, so um, it's just going to be watered down to nothing. And then malabsorption from celiac disease. Uh, remember, celiac... Uh, is a problem specific to grains um, and these guys have to stay away from gluten altogether because it's a big problem for them or short bowel syndrome short bowel syndrome is where your bowels aren't as long as they're supposed to be so it takes time to uh, take the poop and then pull all the nutrients out of it right like so as you're moving down the pipeline of the factory if you will you are grabbing bits of nutrients as you go along and as you're doing that the poo is breaking down and it's becoming more liquefied as it goes down the pipeline so the longer it goes the more liquefied it's going to be um, in this case when you have short bowel syndrome short bowel syndrome basically um, speeds up your ability to to pull those nutrients out um, by way of malabsorption so it just takes everything through the pipeline like sludge and then you have diarrhea I hope I explained that well well enough um, you just aren't able to get what you need and as a result everything just kind of goes through um, and is already in a liquefied state because you can't you can't grab that nutrient off of it I, I think I might have explained that right but just know that these are the non-infectious non -infectious causes I don't think he's going to go that far into it. He may ask about celiac disease. You need to know that that is a malabsorption issue and you do need to know um, that that is a gluten issue. All right, so here are the manifestations from looks like least invasive to most invasive. So upper GI tract, large volume, watery stools, cramping, um, peri umbilical pain, uh, nausea, vomiting, low-grade fever. We've all had that before, right? And then next you have the lower GI tract, which is small volume, uh, bloody diarrhea, fever, getting a little bit worse. So then after that, you have stools that may or may not contain leukocytes, blood, and mucus. And then at the very end, you have severe diarrhea and dehydration. It's life-threatening. Your potassium always is always going to be out of balance. Remember, it's going to be life-threatening if potassium is involved, okay? And then you're going to be in metabolic acidosis, and you're going to have acid base imbalances through the hilt. And then you're going to have, eventually, uh, colitis and intestinal perforation, which is going to lead for you to have a stoma and um, to have a bag and to have to go through that process. 
All right, here are the diagnostic studies and why we're going to do that. We need stool cultures to see if we have blood or mucus or white blood cells or infectious organisms in the stool, so that makes sense. Blood cultures, we need to check for sepsis because if we have a perforation, then it's going to get into our bloodstream by way of internally. And then if we're immunocompromised, it's basically the same process. Uh, white blood cells we need to look at because obviously if they're elevated, that's going to let us know that we have an infection in process. We can go ahead and get a culture. We can find out what's going to kill it and start the antibiotic therapy. Um, anemia from iron and folate deficiencies. Yes, you absolutely need to look at these because remember, if you have iron deficiency anemia, you're not breathing well because... Your iron is what is supported, supporting the oxygen binding capacity in that cell, right? So like the whole point of iron is to provide um, a greater oxygen capacity for that cell to hold so that you could breathe and then it can pass through your bloodstream and that you can utilize that oxygenation to um, send oxygen to the rest of your body in those pathways, right? So uh, we absolutely need to know what that looks like because if we are anemic, then we are not going to successfully do that, which is why we look green, which is why we're freezing cold in our, our hands and our feet because we're putting all of the emergency heat into the core of our temperature to save the stuff that matters, aka my organs, right? Because legs and arms, we can live without organs, we can't. So that's kind of how the body process works. So we have to know if we have iron and folate deficiencies because if we do have those deficiencies, it's going to affect the way we breathe. It's going to affect the way we move. We're going to be exhausted, right? We're going to have thin hair. We're going to have all the bad stuff, right? So BUN, electrolytes, osmolality, okay, this all ties in with if I am depleted of all of my nutrients, I am going to have really, really scary numbers, aka my kidneys are going to be pissed off, right? So my BUN is going to be elevated because I'm going to be dehydrated. That much is simple. Creatinine, there's going to be a lot of toxin in my kidneys, right? So my creatinine is going to show how badly or how poorly that looks. Your osmolality is going to show how much solute or salt you're going to have to solution or fluid in your body, right? So I would expect that you're going to have an osmolality that is going to show me that you have a ridiculously high sodium level, okay? Because you're basically puking out all of your fluids and all that's left left is, you know, the stuff that's hanging around. Um, stool and fat and protein, that's important because if I have uh, fatty stools, that can be indicative of a couple of conditions. If I have protein in my fat, that can also be indicative of a couple of issues. Um, and then, of course, GI hormones is going to be another diagnostic study to let me know if I have things like H. pylori, which is going to absolutely cause me to have things like uh, gastric ulcers. So your treatment for diarrhea is going to be dependent on the cause of diarrhea, right? If it's C. diff, we're going to treat it with vancomycin four times a day, 125 milligrams oral, okay? If it is, um, I have a stomach bug, it's going to be give antibiotics to kill said stomach bug, right? Unless it's a viral process, and then we got to handle it a whole nother way. So it just depends. Um, we need to prevent the transmission next time around. So frequent hand washing, educating our patients, yada, yada. Replacing fluid and electrolytes, oral and or IV. You need to have it done IV first. And then once that's good to go, then you go ahead and increase your drinking. Increasing your fluid intake is not going to fix your IV deficit, okay? Because it's two different pathways. One goes through the gullet. The other one goes through the, ventri or the, the venous system, which is then going to go through the arterial system, which is going to be needed all the way around, okay? So you can't, they're not mutually exclusive drinking water isn't going to fix the problem, which is why we tell them we still have to give them an IV, so sorry about it. Um, and then, of course, protect the skin so that we don't increase our transmission of infection. So the whole purpose of an antidiarrheal is to coat and protect mucous membranes. So we want to coat it around so that we don't get to that raw flesh, okay? Um, and that's within our intestinal lining. Uh, absorb irritating substance. Um, so a lot of times, like we said earlier, it's going to be absorption issues. So this is going to take care of that problem. It's going to inhibit the intestinal transit um, so that it slows it down so that it doesn't go flushing through like it's Drano. Um, it decreases intestinal secretions, which also takes care of all of the fluid associated with having a diarrhea episode. Uh, decreased central nervous system stimulant of GI tract, right? It's going to do all those things. So it's basically going to say, slow down your motility. You need to stop worrying. You need to stop emptying because we're not going to be feeding you because you're not hungry. It's all in your brain, right? That's what it tells you. And then the body goes, oh, okay, fine. 
So the problem with this is, is if we take too many antidiarrheals, too much emodium, then we're going to have prolonged exposure to emodium, and then we're going to have rebound constipation, which is going to impact over time and cause what was called toxic megacolon. Now, when we say toxic megacolon, I mean your intestines are the size of your entire forearm, right? That's how blown up they are from poo. Now what happens when something really, really hard gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and is in a very, very small area that is, I don't know, an intestine, it's going to break, it's going to perforate, the person's going to die right in front of you, it's awful, it's going to get ischemic bowel, right? You're going to go in there and everything's going to be white because it's ischemic because there's no oxygen and it's dead, okay? It's a big problem. Um, prolonged ex exposure um, is going to give toxic megacolon, we just said that, and then antibiotics, um, fluoroquinolone and azithromycin as well are going to be some reasons that you would have these problems, like we said earlier, of, of chronic diarrhea. All right, C. diff, healthcare-associated infection. Um, anyone who is getting antimicrobial, chemotherapy, gastric acid suppressing therapy, immunosuppressive agents, um, C. diff for spores. Okay, they can survive up to 70 days on any surface. That's a big problem. This is why we cannot do serolite. This is why we have to do contact plus, contact plus, contact plus, contact plus. And we have to wash our hands only or we kill things with bleach and that's the only way we get around anything. Hand wash stuff in water, strict infection control precautions, aka contact plus. Prophylactic, prophylaxis or adjunct therapy is the lactobacillus, which is a probiotic, which is going to um, help bring about those normal intestinal flora that are the good bugs that we need in our intestines so the bad bugs get kicked out. All right, C. diff, again, oral vancomycin is going to be your fix. It's going to be for 10 days. Um, also, flagyl, which is metrodiazinol, is an alternative. However, vancomycin works the best. Um, vancomycin and IV metrodiazinol or IV flagyl um, is going to be your vancomycin that you have uh, via enema. Yikes. Um, I guess, yeah, that would make sense if you do have an ileus, you would need to do that versus uh, taking it orally. Um, stop your non-essential antibiotics if you don't need it. Usually it's Zosin. Stop your stool softeners. Stop your laxatives. Stop your, stop your antidiarrheals. I can't tell you how many times I have C. diff tested somebody because they came in for constipation. They gave them a bunch of laxatives, and then they start complaining about diarrhea, and then we C. diff test them, put them in precaution, and then lock them up for 24 hours with the door shut. That's super stupid. Um, but, hey, nothing's perfect in this world. So, Recurrent. Now let's talk about FMT, which is kind of wicked and wild. So that's fecal micro uh, transplantation. And what that is is donor feces. I can't even make this up. Donor feces with donor feces intestinal uh, bugs that are good intestinal bugs, bugs that they then give you via an enema. Um, and then you get a nasal enteral tube or colonoscopy, and they try to give you um, they try to give you this this donor feces to fix the problem. Um, of course, transmission of infection is an issue. Why? Because it's donor feces. That's why. I mean, really, do I need to say these things out loud? For the love of Pete, I really hope you're listening to this because you're just gonna be cracking up most of the time. You're, you're not even gonna be able to pay attention to what I'm saying. Because sometimes I can be a bit ridiculous and a bit extra. And I just realized that. So donor feces, yeah, it might cause infection. Just FYI. Again, these are the subjective data points that we have. Any surgeries or treatments, medications, past medical history. Okay, why is that subjective data? Because people don't remember what they've had. Okay, that's why. Um, objective data would be if we checked care everywhere and we have pulled from the surgeries, medications, and past medical history that we've had annotated and that we've seen. Is it a perfect 100% uh, recap? Nope, because we really don't have a system that works nationally, um, nor do we have one that works internationally as far as medical transcripts are concerned. So we're never going to 100% know, which is why it's considered subjective, okay? All right, our objective data is going to be a synopsis of the systems and diagnostic findings that we have found along the way. So this shows you the pathway of a play in the rollout game. So you consider all diarrhea and infectious processes until we know what it is. Then you do meticulous hand hygiene while you're figuring all that out. Then you flush things in the toilet as they come along, a.k.a. stool or, or anything that comes out of, uh, you know, like vomit or anything of that nature. Um, teach the patient hygiene. 
infection control precautions, the danger of the illness itself, right? Food handling, cooking, storage. This is probably going to be a select all that apply, okay? Um, isolation, gown, gloves for everyone, disinfect with 10% bleach or the C. difficile sporicidal, bottom line, hand washing, and bleach is the only thing that's going to kill this stuff. It is contact plus isolation. All right, so now we're going to slow it down. Did you get it? Because <laughs> we're talking about constipation. Okay, never mind. All right, constipation. We're talking about constipation. All right, so difficult and frequent bowel movements. Uh, you may get uh, excessive exertion. You may vagal yourself and pass out. Uh, the feeling of incomplete evacuation. Um, it is a symptom. It is not a disease. You do not have the disease of constipation, okay? Um, acute is less than a week. Chronic is greater than three months. Again, IBS is somewhere in between all of that because they fluctuate from one to the other and the timing on it's bizarre and we're probably going to get into it in a little bit, I'm sure. Low fiber diet is the number one risk factor for being constipated. Decreased physical activity is probably going to be number two. Um, ignoring the urge to defecate. Uh, I mm, Okay, sure. Maybe maybe if you're... I, Mm, no, no, I'm going to go. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to stop what I'm doing and go to the bathroom. Right. Um, so prolonged retention. Oh yeah, this is important. So what happens is the more you retain the poop, the more the poop pushes into the part where the poop's supposed to exit. Cool. So what happens is as it's pushing the muscle around there says, ah, screw it. I'm not going to worry about it. And it actually relaxes and desensitizes until it finally goes out on its own. So there you go. That sounds pretty. Um, then it dries and as it dries, as it goes down towards the end, um, water gets absorbed, which means it gets harder and harder and then it becomes impossible to get it out, which is super fun. Um, and then people get anxiety and depression from not being able to poop. Really? I think that's a bit extreme. Don't you think so? Emotions? Yeah. You get the emotion of ouch. I'm sure. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, so that's basically all you need to know for this. Low fiber diet, decreased physical activity is a problem. All right, so there are risk factors. Number one is disease that slows GI transit by way of neurological pathways, systemic, collagen, colonic issues and diseases, blah, blah, blah. Okay, then you can get drug induced, and that's from opioids, which I know you know that already. So opioids are going to slow the motility of the intestines, which is always going to cause constipation issues. Um, cathartic colon syndrome. This is from chronic lactulose use or chronic laxative use, um, which gives you basically a habitually dilated colon. Um, cathartic meaning it just kind of stays in the same dilated position at all times. And this is going to lead to bowel, le bowel leakage, which is not uh, very pretty at all. All right, we can go from mild to severe severe discomfort all the way to um, ostipation, which is where you are so fecally impacted um, that you can't even pass gas um, or fecal impaction or perforation as well. Um, and then there's a little bit of deviation in between. So it could be mild, moderate, severe. That's all this says. So when you're doing an examination, make sure that you are checking abdomen, perineal area, rectal area, um, any sudden persistent change in bowel habits greater than six weeks, uh, bloody stools, anemia, weight loss, blah, 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 blah. You need to have those looked at. Um, abdominal x-rays are good ways to start. And then, of course, we'll do a barium swallow or barium enema, which would be the opposite end versus the swallowing. Um, sigmoidoscopy is going to be your scope to see what's going on in there. Sometimes they have to uh, take it out surgically. It's just a, a big, that's the balloon expulsion. It's just a big thing. Um, so, yeah, there's studies. How about that? There's There's studies. So obviously increase in dietary fiber, fluids, and exercise are the big ones. Laxatives, making sure that you don't take them regularly. If they are a stimulant laxative, all other laxatives are cool. Um, stimulant laxatives daily are bad because it will cause rebound constipation. Um, enema, same diff, same deal. You got to watch out for those. You can't keep doing it. The Your, your booty muscles and your booty um, receptors are going to go on strike because they're not getting what they need. And they will go on strike and get mad. And that's how we end up with constipation. Um, same deal. Preferably acting opioid receptor agonist is going to do the same thing. Biofeedback, same diff. Um, making sure that we do a colonostomy. 
um, or an ileostomy or fecal diversion by way of an ostomy of some type is sometimes what you have to do if you have these problems and you can't get them fixed. So here is what we want you to push. Push two liters a day of fluids, probiotics, which is like an Activia or a yogurt, um, and vegetable fruits and grains added on. So as silly as it sounds, our education is going to be, hey, drink more. Hey, eat better. Hey, add some more fiber. Hey, move around. And oh, yeah, by the way, if you got to poop, go poop. And uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't shove a bunch of things up there that don't need to be shoved up there because all you need to do is just drink and eat fiber. Okay, great. That's literally how this goes. Um, also, educating them on the defecating position. People don't know how to poop. I cannot make these things up. Have you seen people poop? They do it all kinds of different ways. I've seen somebody stand on the toilet seat, one foot on the left side of the toilet seat, one foot on the right side of the toilet seat, and they squat into the hole. And that was a trip to watch because, wow, that was impressive. I haven't seen anyone bend like that since, wow, that's that was something. So they really don't know how to do these things. They don't know about, you know, things like squatty potties. I like You just have to give them education on, on their bowel habits and tell them what to do to make things better. So now we're going to move into the wide world of acute abdominal pain and laparotomy, which basically means anytime you have to cut into an abdomen. All right, so this is scary. Any type of acute belly issues can be non-emergent or they can be life-threatening and there's really no in-between. So you have to make sure that you're taking care of these immediately. If you have sudden insidious onset and needs immediate attention, it could be life-threatening, okay? It can cause organ damage. It can cause infection, obstruction, bleeding, perforation. Perforation results in peritonitis. Peritonitis is when I stab into my abdominal lining uh, past my muscle group. So like it is the stuff, it is the stuff that holds the candy in its place. So it is the wrapper of the Werther's original to the Werther's original, which would be your organ, right? So when you break that and you perforate that, you bleed into it everything that's not supposed to be in there. Because the whole purpose of having that, that candy paper on the outside is to preserve the candy on the inside, right? AKA the organ. So then things go awry and then we have obstruction and then you get a hypovolemic shock and then you die. It's a bad day. So either we're going to look at septic shock or hypovolemic shock. Either way, it spells death. So here are the pathways and the etiology behind all of them. I Do I think he's going to test you on which or which is going to cause, be caused by what? I I doubt it because they're both intercorrelated. So just know that with these issues, inflammation, peritonitis, obstruction, internal bleeding, we could have a lot of reasons for that happening. It can turn into a lot of things. And if it has to do with bleeding, they're in hypovolemic shock. It has to do with infection. It's a septic shock. And we'll just leave it at that. It's easier to remember. So we're going to have to assess for pain because the number one side effect is pain because guess what? It hurts. So make sure that you understand, do an old cart, right? Onset, location, duration, uh, stuff, 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 C-A-R-T, whatever that is. Um, position, uh, fetal position, supine position, seated, restless. Yep, that's pretty accurate. So they're going to be laying sideways, trying not to move too much. They're going to be laying flat on their belly. Um, they're going to be restless and thrashing. It's very, very painful. So these are the diagnostic studies you, you would do to make sure that we're not missing anything. And then we move on from the slide. So our goal is to identify and treat the cause. It is to treat the complications and the shock, and then we deal with pain management last. Uh, these are the two procedures that we do to fix any type of perforation. One is just basically a scope, and one is removing something that needs removed. Of course, as nurses, we need to make sure we're doing eyes and nose, mental status changes, monitor for shock or fever, make sure we're perfusing, make sure that we're doing abdominal inspection to make sure we're not having another infection, check pain, nausea, vomiting, bowel habits, blah, 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 blah. Making sure that you don't have hypovolemic shock is you're going to be your number one thing that you're going to be looking out for when you're talking about any type of um, gastric issues or abdominal issues, right? So that's going to be the number one thing we don't want. Um, we might have to put in an NG tube. We're always going to have to assess the pain. We're always going to have to assess fluid and electrolytes. It's that simple. All right, so how do we fix this? Um, well, postoperatively, we want to do an NG tube, monitor the drainage until we're ready to start incorporating meals, manage nausea, vomiting, monitor vital signs and electrolytes. Early ambulation is going to help with peristalsis, which is going to help with an ileus because it's going to help the gut motility, and then maybe we can pass wind, and if we pass wind, we won't have a perforation. Uh, let's see, ambulatory care. Yep, 
activity modifications, diet, drug therapy, complications, so that they know when to watch out for an infection. Now, our evaluation is going to be important. Where our desired outcomes is everything to be fine. So normal fluid electrolyte imbalance, normal, um, normal relief of abdominal pain, no complications, resolution of the pain. All right, now we move on to abdominal trauma, which becomes a little bit hairier, but not, not that much. Blunt or penetrating trauma sucks. How about that? Liver lacerations, ruptured spleens, ruptured kidneys, bruised kidneys, perforated uh, lungs happen often. Pancreas gets burst in half sometimes. Kidneys blow up entirely. Okay. I had a friend of mine who was in jump school. He was 82nd Airborne, and he fell out of the Apache helicopter at about 150 feet. He didn't die. No, no. Surprisingly, he landed on his back, and his kidney blew up <laughs> like a grenade. Right. Blew up. And then later, believe it or not, he got kidney cancer on that side. But his kidney blew up, right? Yeah, it did blow up. And guess what else did? The cells along with it. So doesn't that suck? For sure, for sure. So that's what happens with that. Uh, motor vehicle accident, direct blows, falls, like we just talked about, knife or gunshot as well. All right, so here's the difference with the problems we have. Shock is bleeding from the solid organ itself. If I am bleeding from my belly, from the outside to the inside, that's a problem, okay? Um, hollow organ spills into contents. That's when we're talking about the candy wrapper to the candy. That is peritonitis. That's where we have uh, the organ that pops out of that peritoneal area. And that would be the equivalent of if you grab a Hollis cough drop from your mom's purse that's been sitting in there for a month, you can still see a little piece of that red Hollis cough drop before you twist off that paper. It's the same concept. Um, abdominal compartment syndrome, yikes, this is even a bigger deal. Uh, decreased ventilation or respiratory failure, decreased cardiac output, venous return, and arterial perfusion or renal, renal failure. This is a big problem. Um, abdominal compartment syndrome usually happens one of two ways. It usually happens as a result of a burn. That is a circumferential burn. Um, and which means uh, the swelling increases the pressure on that diaphragm, which uh, decreases your ability to take a normal breath, right? Because the body's got to give. That's why we expand and contract. And if I have a really, really a tight wound uh, corset around it by way of a third degree burn, um, I'm not going to be able to breathe. The other way um, is if, well, this actually happened. Um, I had a, uh, a buddy of mine who lost his dad right in front of him because he was, they were digging a trench and he was at the bottom of the trench and he prematurely dumped the sand into the trench before his dad got out and his dad was buried chest deep and he could not dig him out fast enough so even though he was looking at his son and screaming for his son to fix it he had thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of dirt on his chest so he could not expand and contract that chest and he died within about 95 seconds like it was fast while his son tried to desperately dig him out it was awful so this is how you have these um, circumferential issues in the the abdominal compartment syndrome which is nearly fatal within a, a matter of 15 minutes or less so here are the classic signs of all the bad things, okay? Signs of hypovolemic shock, abrasions or bru bruising, Cullen's or Gray Turner sign. Those are signs for internal injury via a motor vehicle accident. Um, guarding or splinting the abdomen is never good. Hard distended abdomens usually lead, mean an internal bleed, um, and so on and so forth. All right, whenever we have these type of patients, we are at baseline, getting a UA and we're getting a CBC, okay? CBC is going to let us know what we're missing, right? We're just going to let us know if we got hematuria everywhere, um, if we have an onset of internal bleeding somewhere that we're not aware of, et cetera, et cetera. Your analysis is going to let us know if we have potentially ruptured a bladder uh, by way of trauma blood. Um, ABGs, obviously, if you can't breathe or if you're confused, uh, prothrom prothrombin time to see um, how long you were able to bleed and then clot uh, your electrolytes. You need to make sure you're not losing those because you got a burn, et cetera, et cetera. 
All right, emergency management is going to be NG tube, IV access, and fluids, and that's all there is to it. Make sure that you, they don't have deteriorate, they don't have a need for surgery, get surgery involved if they do. Um, do not repeat. Do not remove the impaled object. If you remove the impaled object, you have effectively pulled the plug at the bottom of a canteen when you were trying to drain it. Um, or a cooler when you're trying to drain the ice out of it. That's what you've done when you've removed that object. Do not remove that object. So IBS is going to be a common uh, chronic abdominal pain uh, cause. Uh, pancreatitis, hepatitis, um, adhesions, vascular insufficiency. Um, all those are going to be pretty standard. Um, treatment's going to be dependent upon the cause. Obviously, if you got hepatitis, you can treat it differently than irritable bowel syndrome. So just keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer, third leading cause of cancer-related deaths. Third most common form of cancer. More common in men. Increase in age increases the disease propensity. 90% de detected over the age of 50, which is why we start to do these colorectal tests at the age of 50 and above, where they say he pee in the poo or poo in the cup send it out and then we will let you know if you're going to have colon cancer if you have it right um it's increasing from people age 20 to 49 they really can't figure out why they suspect it's because of all the new chemicals and vape stuff that we have going on right now go figure um, also, all the poor things that we've been eating over time um, with all of the pect hormones, because this is something that isn't happening uh, worldwide. This is a nationwide problem in this age bracket. And again, the winner of the worst genetic issues associated with a race goes to the african-american community i hate this i so hate this right but it's everything if you look at it it feels like it is just everything so most likely to develop colorectal cancer and die from it black community i hate that so much and what are we doing to help it mm, nothing <laughs> absolutely nothing um so with blacks and hispanics it occurs at an earlier age Hispanics are least likely to get screened, which is why they have the issue. And that's because they're not used to traditional Western medicine. That's not a thing for them. They don't really like it very much. They're not a big fan of it. They have a lot of spiritual medicine within their culture, just like Native Americans do. Um, so we much prefer that over the alternative where, you know, some dude in a white coat sticks his finger at you and tells you what you've done wrong and how you shouldn't do it. And then I meet them over at KFC eating the crappiest food that ever existed and smoking a pack of camels with their top salon. So, you know, what do you do with that? What do you do? People are hypocrites. So know that this is uh, Lynch syndrome is a specific type of colorectal cancer that is an autosomal dominant disorder. I say it just like that because you need to know that. I would imagine that's going to be a thing. So Lynch syndrome is hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, which is NHPCC. Um, it increase the risk of other organ cancers yes it does uh, because usually it increases the risk if you have colorectal cancer and you have lynch syndrome it usually increases the risk of kidney and adrenal cancer uh need for annual colonoscopy well yeah duh because that's a big deal so bottom line this slide says if you have family members that have colorectal cancer and a history of irritable bowel disease in your family you have a high high risk of getting colorectal cancer in a hereditary form or because of an abnormal crass oncogene um, smoking obesity red meat um, alcohol diabetes all going to make it worse so you're just asking for trouble if you do those things and you have that history so again, this is the last slide just made over. Factors that decrease it, healthy weight, uh, physical activity, uh, don't drink, no, don't, no, don't smoke, and then eat a diet with fruits, vegetables, and grains. I mean, I feel like a five-year-old could tell me these things. Um, and yet here we are uh, as grown adults learning this uh, nearly all the way through your program because people still don't get it. And we still have to learn it, you know, as as 40 year olds with multiple doctoral degrees, et cetera, et cetera. I still have to tell people, hey, tell people not to smoke or drink alcohol because it increases your risk of everything. So, yep, know those things. OK. Colorectal cancer usually starts as a polyp. 
usually starts in the inner lining of the colon or the rectum, which is why they do an endoscopy. It grows in 10 to 20 years, so it's very slow growing. It invades the wall of your colon or your rectum. You will get lymph nodes. You will get vasculature issues as it spreads, okay? Venous return is going to be um, inferior rectal vein to the portal vein to the liver, which is how you get liver mets. And when you get liver mets, it goes to the lungs. When you get lungs, it goes to the bone. When it goes to the bone, it goes to the brain. And when it goes to the brain, you are kaput. So that is the pathway of this via colorectal cancer. It goes colon, liver, lungs, bones, brain, yikes. Okay. These are the polyps, and this is how we know that the person has colorectal cancer and how bad it is and what they need to do. Usually these guys can have it removed, but sometimes these guys have to have entire intestine sections removed, and sometimes that's still not enough, and they just have to die of colorectal cancer, and it's terrible. All right, so here's how this goes. Um, you don't usually know until it's in its advanced stages, much like everything else, right? So you'll start having iron deficiency anemia, you'll start having rectal bleeding, you'll start having abdominal pain that's kind of insidious and doesn't make any sense, change in bowel habits, and then you'll go from that to like fatigue and massive weight loss, and then you will go from that to like a palpable abdominal mass, or you'll have a, a large liver or hepatomegaly, um, and then you'll have a, a, a full belly uh, or ascites, and you'll have those weird you know spider veins in your belly called the caput medusa all right i suspect you're going to need to know these so the right-sided colorectal cancer is bleeding is more common um early sign of anemia it's going to have diarrhea with it okay and then left-sided is hematoschesia or fresh blood in the stool like pure blood like those are the gi bleeds and that's usually from a bowel obstruction okay so know those these are the pains that you're going to experience based off of the area that it's at um, when you're dealing with these type of uh, colorectal cancer issues. All right, so here's the new screening tool. From ages 45 to 75, you have to have one of the following exams, okay? And you have to continue to do that until you're 75. And at that point, they'll stop messing with you, I swear. Because at that point, if you haven't had it, you're not going to get it. So you need to know what these numbers look like and then what the ages look like because it might come back on you. So again, we've got the fecal occult blood test that we're going to do yearly, um, or you're going to have the, um, the fit test as well, which is testing for blood in the stool. Um, and then it's also going to show cells of tumors. Um, and then you have the DNA mutations every three years uh, via stool, and that's the new one that they're using that is a home test that they're giving you nowadays. So we need to know that the gold standard for diagnostic studies for colorectal cancer is colonoscopy, okay? Entire colon is examined, they biopsy it, they remove polyps, they send it to the laboratory, and then um, they do that every 10 years starting at 45, okay? Um, and then they let you know what that looks like. All right, so they have a TNM system, which is the tumor node metastasis system. So prognosis is worse depending on if you are getting a greater size and depth of your tumor, if you're getting lymph node involvement, if you're getting metastasis. This is pretty obvious. If I have a tumor that's getting bigger, I'm getting worse. If I have a tumor that goes into my lymph nodes, if my lymph nodes are everywhere, then it's going to spread the cancer everywhere. So that's bad. And then guess what? That causes metastasis. Okay, done. That's exactly what the slide says. So the goal with all of this is to hope that you can get the tumor. Um, they're going to explore the abdomen and put some dye down. If the dye turns blue, that means it's a hot spot. That means that's cancer. Then they chip away at it, right? Like that's how they do it. It's just cut and drop, cut and drop. Um, a removal of all the lymph nodes that drain the area is also important because remember, you get into the lymph, you're screwed, right? Uh, restoration of bowel continuity as best as possible. Uh, and then prevention of surgical complications like infection. Now, sometimes they're lucky enough and they can resect the colorectal cancer when they're already in there during a colonoscopy, and then they just chop the entire polyp and then they use the same process to chip away at all of it because sometimes it's not that deep into the colon, right? You got to remember polyps are an extension of what is actually dug deeper, right? So it actually grows from the inside out. And the out is the inside of the intestine, right? The outside of the intestinal lining. So it's actually growing in deeper than that, like a nail into a wall. And the picture would be the polyp, right? Because that's the extension of the wall. 
So that's kind of how this works. And they are trying to make sure that they cut everything out and uh, the cancer is well differentiated. In other words, it's well separated and it's not going to get into the lens system. So obviously you need to talk about staging and what that means and how big it's going to be and what that's going to mean for that. So these are the options for stage one tumors. Just look over it, understand it, and then move on. So stage one is going to be resection. Stage two is going to be wide resection. Um, and then our stage two high risk is going to be that plus chemotherapy. Okay. And then three is absolutely going to be surgery and chemotherapy. Um, and then sometimes chemotherapy and radiation as well. Okay. To reduce the tumor size. All right, palliative surgery is for resectable or non-resectable tumors, so that means we can't operate, it's not going to fix anything. But what we can do is we can decondition the amount of spreading that's gone to other areas. So like if you have cancer that wraps around your spinal column, you can't walk. And you do get bone cancer, remember, that's right before the brain. So it goes bones, brain, done. So once it gets to your bones, you're going to be walking and washing dishes or doing something, and then all of a sudden you're going to fall to the ground, you're never going to get up again. And that's because you didn't have radiation to shrink down those tumors. So an idea of non-resectable tumors or metastasis uh, palliative intervention would be considered to get that radiation treatment for 15 days so that you're able to walk again or able to move your foot and feel like a human being for five seconds. So these are colon resections. There's the abdominal perennial resection. You have a permanent colonoscopy or a colostomy for that. There's no getting around that. You have to. Um, you would have a J pouch or a jejunum pouch or a coloplasty, which is a little bit different, but basically um, you get a temporary ileostomy and then they would create a, res a reservoir in the jejunum, which would then act as that area. It's a long story. So one's lower anterior resection, one's abdominal perennial resection. So you'll know one needs permanent colonoscopy or col colostomy. I don't know why I can't get that today. Okay, so one's going to have a permanent colostomy, and then the other one is going to have a temporary colostomy or ileostomy, and then a reservoir. Of course, chemotherapy, the goal is to shrink the tumor, um, and then we do uh, resections for three and high-risk stage two, and then we talked about palliative treatment, and then let's see, these are the fluorouracil and the leucoverin uh, with the oxalopathin is going to be the preferred protocol for medications. I would look at that. I would try to find a way to remember that these are associated with chemo. I, I don't understand any of these, so I would definitely understand how this would be associated with chemo because I can't get it. So maybe that'll, maybe that'll help you find a way to remember those. All right, so when we're dealing with targeted therapy for metastatic uh, colorectal cancer, angiogenesis inhibitors inhibit the ability for blood to supply uh, sustainment and nutrients to the tumors, right? So the tumors live off a of blood supply. They get no blood supply, then they die. It's that simple. Um, they block uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, same deal. So they block the ability for the tissue, the epidural, the epidermal tissue to have that tumor continue to grow. Um, it blocks the enzymes for, for the cell to grow. It impairs the DNA function and the angiogenesis or the creation of it. Um, it just shuts it down altogether. All right, so we talked about radiation therapy and how it is a con combination um, surgery and therapy to shrink things, to reduce the size, to create palliative therapy for meds. That's all this says. So as much as this is easy stuff to comprehend, I want to keep it in here because this would be a select all that apply question, potentially. So health promotion, encourage all persons older than 45 to have regular colorectal cancer screenings, help identify those at high risk, discuss with patients about the early screening to keep mortality rates down, um, and then realize that fear and lack of info creates barriers to prevention of these activities. So this looks like a select all that apply opportunity, so just keep those in mind. Make sure that people understand they have to do the colon prep. If you don't do the colon prep, they're not going to be able to see what's going on because you're going to have poop in your colon and you need a clean colon. That's all the slide says. Obviously, if these guys have drains or they have to have wound care or ostomy care, you need to get in with a wound and ostomy nurse so that they can be educated. That's all the slide says. So now we're going to go into actually what a bowery section looks like and an ostomy surgery looks like. Um, ostomy surgery is actually not that difficult. It's pretty quick. So we want to remove cancer. 
We want to repair things. We want to fix an obstruction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, so these are the different types of procedures that they have. We're going to get into them bit by bit. Um, just try to keep them separated as best as you can and try to understand the differences in between them. Most of them, uh, anytime you see ileostomy, you know ileostomy is going to be in a different position than a hemicolectomy, right? So we'll get into it in just a second. So ostomy means stoma. It means creating a stoma. It means creating a pouch so the poop can go somewhere, right? These are the areas they do it, ascending, transverse, and sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon is right before your main colon. It's shaped like an S, S for sigmoid. It's right uh, where it dumps to the anus, basically. No pun intended, but pun intended. So make sure that you understand what part goes where. Um, it could be temporary, it could be permanent, it just depends. And then here are the pathways from a visual perspective so you can see exactly what's going on from the inside. So there's a lot of information on the slide, and I don't want you to get too wrapped up in it, okay? So just know that an ileostomy means you have a different type of pouch, and you have a reservoir, right? So you have your little pouch, and then you have the little ring around it that sticks to the pouch, right? You get low residue diet for more fluid stool, so it's manually drained. That's all you need to worry about, those things right there, right? So it's in the ileum which means it's going to be in a different position that if it were a jejunum, right, or a jejunostomy, right? So don't get too wrapped up in all the other stuff in between. I don't see this on your, on your guided notes, so I'm not too worried about it. So whenever you have a distal bowel removed, you're going to have a permanent stoma, okay? Um, whenever you close the stoma, it's called a Harpsen pouch. I don't know if you need to know that. I seriously doubt that he's going to test you on that, though. Um, a loop stoma is temporary. That's why we call it a loop versus an end. If it's an end, that means the end is the end. That means you're not getting another one. If it's a loop, that means it's a loop. We can go ahead and fix the loop and put it back in 10 to 7, 7 to 10 days usually. Um, and sometimes they last a little bit longer. Sometimes they last six months. It just depends. This is getting far too complicated when we're talking about double barrel stomas. I doubt your questions are going to include a double barrel stoma. Just know that they're divided into two and one is proximal and one is distal and one is for diversion and one is for a fistula and that's it. Okay. And it's usually temporary. I don't know why he would test you on that, but he might. So just keep it in mind. And here are the different uh, pouches. So you can see that they're completely separated from one another. It is a permanent move. It can't be fixed, um, but they do it that way so that they can put the sigmoid uh, colostomy in place and uh, do it at the, the approximation of the descending colon. This is a loop ostomy. You can see how it would be a temporary deal because zoop, it's just looped in there and then zoop, it can go right back in. So these have to be done into the rectus muscle um, so that it decreases the risk of a hernia. you got to give your patient education. You're going to have to give them support. It's a big adjustment. It's embarrassing. Um, it's unsightly for a lot of people. Um, it's debilitating. So try to keep these things into consideration when you're trying to educate them. Obviously, you got to monitor your stoma. you got to monitor your incision. you got to make sure you're not going to have anything that's going to have delayed wound healing or infection propensity. Um, I don't feel like I need to tell you any more than just that right there. Obviously, the first 24 to 48 hours, you're not going to have much in the bag, uh, but you need to do strict eyes and O's. Um, let's see here. Monitor your electrolyte balances. you got to make sure for that because we got to watch our sodium and our calcium. Um, you should get 1,500 to 1,800 milliliters a day once peristalsis increases. Uh, that usually takes about three to five days. Um, for that to start working up, and then as things go along, uh, your feces will then thicken up a little bit um, and then decrease to a lower volume, but a higher content of volume, if that makes any sense. Crohn's carries with them an increased risk of obstruction for 30 days because the tissue is so inflamed that it's easy to break, um, so you need to keep that in mind. Uh, four to six stools a day. Um, it, it causes big problems that last sometimes for months, sometimes it's for days. Um, you just have a lot of problem. You have phantom rectum pains. You have uh, mucus that just comes out and leaks. There's just a lot of problems with it. Again, it's debilitating. This would be another reason sometimes for an ostomy. Obviously, we're going to educate them. Stay away from odor, gas, and diarrhea-producing foods. 
um, when you're dealing with an ostomy. Um, talk to them about the things. There's ostomy nurses that can get into depth about sexual activity. So I would encourage you to go to the certified wound ostomy nurse. Um, oh yeah, wound ostomy certified nurse, WACN. Um, have them go with those guys and they should be able to do their normal stuff in about a month. All right, pouches are adhesive, pouches are clips, pouches are this, pouches are that. Um, you can uh, shower with them, you can swim with them. Some have filters, some have uh, deodorizers, et cetera, et cetera. Best pouches are open-ended and drainable. I do agree with that statement. Um, you need to record your fluid intake. You need to make sure that you are securing the pouch and you are not getting any of that onto the actual uh, healthy tissue because we don't want to break it apart too. Um, you have to let them know chew thoroughly. We talked about that earlier with chronic dumping syndrome, how that has to happen. Especially nuts, popcorn, raisins, they all come back in bits. All right, so now we're going to talk about, um, you know, care after an ostomy. It's, it's a discussion. It's, it's a lot. I mean, think about that for a second. If you had to deal with that, what that would feel like. And then you're trying to be intimate with somebody. I mean... It, most people have trouble being intimate, you just being in their skin and being perfectly functional. So could you only imagine? Um, so, you know, you need to talk, talk to them about, um, you know, things that are uncomfortable sometimes. So <clears throat> we need to let them know, hey, you may have dysfunction. And why would that be? Well, because you're trying to navigate all of these new things. That's why. And um, I'm sorry if that's the last thing on your brain, considering. So I feel like we should probably just read through this and understand um, that fear of rejection is a thing. I mean, uh, people are incredibly cruel. There was actually a comedian back in like 2010, and uh, there was someone I knew that used to listen to him readily and thought Gee, they were the funniest people in the world. And let me listen to a quick excerpt of them. And they were bragging about dating this girl and taking advantage of this girl and was making fun of them on a comedy skit about having one of these. Seriously? Seriously. Somebody else profited off of an experience that they had intimately with somebody that had an ostomy. Could you imagine? Oh my God. What is the nerve of people anymore? Like, I don't get it. Ugh, I don't think I was meant to get it. You know, thank the world for autism spectrum if that's the case. Like, cool. I'll stay in the land of, of being the Mad Hatter any day of the week. I'll be the mad scientist. If it means that I don't have that in my brain or in my soul, cool. Because that just hurts me even thinking about it. Like, that physically crushes me. And somebody would do that. So, yeah. None of my babies would do that. So there's, there you go. There's the last slide. I'm proud of you. I love you. You got through with the last slide. It was 160 slides. That was a lot. It was a lot. But hey, we got through it and uh, we're better for it. So, all right. Signing off, friends.